Okay, welcome to the second session once more time. My name is Dautin Lunga. Uh, it's my honor to present our speakers today, Professor Melba Crawford and Professor Sharab Prasad. So I'll start with just going through the bio for Professor uh, Crawford, who's an NC Uridil and Francis Perso Professor in Civil Engineering at Purdue where she's also a professor in the Schools of Electro and Computer Engineering and the Department of Agronomy. I should mention that the prophet played uh, a very important role during my PhD studies at Purdue. So it's always an honor to keep on, you know, in touch and interacting with her. She previously was an engineering foundation endowed professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, where she founded the Interdisciplinary Research and Application Development Program in space-based and airborne remote sensing. Dr. Crawford's research focuses on development of machine learning-based algorithms for classification and prediction and applications of these methods to hyperspectral and LIDAR remote, remotely sensed data. She has co-authored more than 200 publications in scientific journals, conference proceedings, book chapters, and technical reports. Dr. Crawford is a fellow and a live member of IEEE, the past president of the IGPE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, an IGPE GRSS distinguished lecturer, and an associate editor of the IGPE Transaction in Geoscience and Remote Sensing, and the past treasurer of the IGPE Technical Activities Board. She's received the GRSS Outstanding Service Award in 2020 and the IGPE GRSS Dave Langreb, Langreb Research Award in 2021. Surely she is no stranger to our community she's you know been serving the community for as long as i've been introduced to remote sensing so it's an honor to present dr crawford let me move to dr prasad he's a senior member of itp senior member who received his phd in electrical and computer engineering from mississippi state university in 2008 he is currently an associate professor within the Department of Electron and Computer Engineering at University of Houston in Texas, where he directs the Machine Learning and Signal Processing Laboratory. His lab focuses on advanced state-of-the-art machine learning and signal processing with applications to remote sensing and biomedicine. His work has been recognized uh, from his early, early PhD grad, graduate student work uh, with student hours during his PhD, a best paper award at the IG at the IGAS 2008 conference with the top 10% top at IEEE of, of his papers in IEEE ICIP conference and NASA New Investigator Early Career Award in 2014 and a Junior Faculty Research Excellence Award at the University of Houston in 2017. He currently serves as an associate editor for the IEEE Signal Processing Letters and the IEEE Transaction on geoscience remote sensing. Again, for Dr. Prasad, no stranger to our community, somebody who's been instrumental in a lot of activities. So it's glad to see him uh, and both uh, and Dr. Crawford, you know, step up to provide this lecture today, which is, as I understand, on GeoAI advances in machine learning for analysis of geospatial imagery. So a few comments before I hand over to Professor Crawford and Professor Prasad, you are invited as for the last two days to post your comments, questions on the chat program. And I do ask for Professor Crawford, Crawford uh, and Professor Prasad to read back the questions as we do have a streaming service for those who are watching on YouTube channel. And those questions that are posted on the chat do not appear on our streaming channel. With that, over to you, Professor Crawford and Professor Prasad. All right, thank you so much, Dalton, for inviting us. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here and speak with you all um, on this topic. And so um, I will get started and uh, and sort of tell you what the, the the logistics of how we would run this, and uh, just just to introduce the topic first. So we would be talking on uh, geo AI um, specifically. We'll be talking on advances in machine learning uh, for analysis of uh, uh, geospatial imagery. So uh, 
in addition to Dr. Crawford and I, uh, we have two PhD students from our respective groups who will be uh, joining us in the in the last part of this session uh, to give some hands-on uh, experience with um, Python scripts, um, it, setting up some uh, networks and, and doing some uh, experiments with, with real data. So that's, that's the plan for today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, ask either during or towards in, in between our talks. Um, and I'll be, we will be happy to address those. <clears throat> All right, so this is the outline for today. Uh, we've broken this down into three um, pieces. Um, in, in part one, I will be reviewing um, sort of uh, deep learning for classification of geospatial imagery. So I'll, I'll give context of where this community has come from in, in the pre-deep learning era and, and more recently, what are the things that that we are working on as as a community? What are the interesting ideas and topics that that are worthy of that that are that are still open for exploration and, and things of that nature? In um, so so this piece is focused more on classification and and a little bit of semantic segmentation. Um, in part two, uh, Dr. Crawford is going to cover advances in deep learning for object detection and prediction, and she in in addition to that, she'll also provide some interesting. Uh, use cases some agricultural use cases and, and some related studies where these these uh, problems could be applied to and so you'll see in the context of how to implement a real life uh, implement a, a deep network to a real life problem what it takes right so you, you get that context and then in part three we've created some python notebooks and we'll step through those with you uh, and, and so uh, two PhD students, Anand Yagmore at uh, UH and Veilu at Purdue will we'll work with you and, and step through some of these examples um, with, with some real data sets. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the agenda. All right, so with that, I'll get started with part one. <clears throat> and so in, in this part, I will be uh, sort of introducing deep learning for classification. Um, and I'll begin by introducing some image and uh, some challenges and opportunities in, in regards to image analysis for geospatial imagery. Um, I'll, I'll talk just a bit about the evolution from model-based and statistical approaches towards deep learning. <clears throat> and then we'll review some deep learning architectures, some nuances of when you when you have to when you now have to apply these models on geospatial imagery, what what are the kind of things you you, you need to watch out for and, and uh, optimize. And then uh, we'll towards the end, we'll start talking about more advanced topics and addressing specific issues like, well, we don't always have a lot of ground truth and there's a lot of variability in sensing conditions and then um, in, in multi-sensor, multi-temporal sensing environments. And so how can you address those uh, in this setup? I just wanted to add one thing. If um, if there's a question in the chat uh, and I don't respond, uh, please don't hesitate to unmute and and ask. Because um, um, the chat, even though it's open here, I I may not uh, have seen it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So just a little overview of um, of uh, passive optical geospatial imagery. Right. So. Now, depending on your background, if, if you've uh, worked with passive optical or not, you may or may not be familiar with some of these, but I'll, I'll just nevertheless um, spend a minute or two just talking about, about this. So passive optical imagery is sensing in the, um, in, in typically in the visible near infrared, short wave infrared type regimes. Uh, and depending on the sensing uh, modality, depending on the sensor that you're using to image, you, you'd basically be looking at multispectral or hyperspectral imagery, right? And so um, <clears throat> multispectral imagery would take the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, break it down into discrete, uh, in, into a few discrete strategically placed bands, channels. And uh, you would typically be imaging in those channels. Now, uh, 
in 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 many cases at a higher resolution and if if you if you're talking about space born platforms um on the flip side <clears throat> hyperspectral imagery would take that same spectrum and sample it in contiguous uh bands with uh very very narrow channels right and so for every pixel in a hyperspectral imagery you can think of extract you'd be able to extract out a spectroscopic profile uh and so the the hope is that this is like a fingerprint of what you're imaging right so you can uh you can image you you don't just get a a an image that you can recognize visually but for every pixel in in a hyperspectral cube you can get a spectroscopic profile and you can you can look at the chemistry and 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 try to infer the material properties from the chemistry of of the image of what you're imaging okay and so that's it, it's a really powerful technique uh but then if you've got to open up resolution in the spectral domain you'd often for example with spacebar platforms you'd have to compromise the resolution in the spatial domain so that's that's kind of the uh, trade-off that plays off during sensing now of course you can put in in this day and age you can put hyperspectral cameras on drones and 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 acquire imagery at, at much closer range much higher resolution uh, you could acquire hyperspectral imagery on the ground and so the, some of these issues have, have gone away but still if you, you if you, if you're sensing from far away that's that's kind of a typical trade off that will play off that that you that you'll have to work with okay so uh in in terms of a few bands versus in multispectral versus hundreds to thousands of bands in hyperspectral now clearly you can you would think that uh hyperspectral is the way to go and and it it really can provide a lot of useful information but we have to keep in mind that it could be a double edged sword because you are now <clears throat> significantly increasing uh the information that you're feeding and that you have to analyze uh for your uh task so uh if you're building models if you're doing any sort of learning in the space you're now living in a much higher dimensional vector space per pixel right so that's that's a trade off that you have to deal with in terms of so in in this framework uh what are the kind of challenges that you would typically see well if you're trying to do supervised learning so the first would be label data right so of course we all know if you have enough label data you can you can build reasonably good models right i mean you've seen that with in in the computer vision community if you've got image net you can train very nice deep classifiers that do reasonably well that do very well in fact for image analysis tasks right um but <clears throat> acquiring label data uh on the ground over a wide geographic range that captures that diversity in the, in the classes and the variability in the classes is 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 very challenging some often times and also very costly so it's it's in, in a way prohibitive to have a lot of training data for your applications right then there's a lot of variability uh that that can come into play right uh depending on the the geometry of the where the sun was when you were imaging and where the satellite or or the aircraft was when you were imaging for example that's just one example atmospheric conditions could could play a part in the variability as well and so on right. <clears throat> then you've got to consider issues of cross sensor adaptation um unlike the everyday images in in computer vision tasks which are typically captured by rgb cameras so although the sensors may be different camera to camera they typically imaging in the same range in, in the same optical uh space and so um unlike that situation in 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 the realm of geospatial imagery where you've got constellation of satellites looking down potentially in different parts sensing in different parts of the spectrum um so you you've got to now the that problem of can you train on one type of uh sensor and and then adapt it to another type becomes an acutely important problem here to 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 be able to address <clears throat> all right so before we begin with uh the, the the approaches i'll take a few minutes just to just to show you some data sets 
and give you an idea of the type of problems that you would be uh, that, that you may run into if you're uh, working with such data, right? So in, in the context of urban land cover uh, classification or, or understanding urban land cover, uh, you may run into a situation where you're given an optical image and you'd like to be able to classify uh, that image into the key urban land cover classes. Right. So as part of uh, the IADF uh, challenge in, in 2018, we released this uh, multi-sensor data set um, where we basically provided an image, uh, images over the U of H campus. And the images represented a couple of uh, sort of dominant land cover classes that I list here. And then we, we created and provided ground truth uh, to the community to train their models and algorithms. And uh, so, so the type of data we provided with high, was a hyperspectral image, a very high resolution RGB image and, and multi-spectral LIDAR. And so um, the, the way we released this was we provided this piece, the, the piece that you see in red is, is what we would consider the training piece, the training data. And so we provided the ground truth for this, which you can see here along with the multi-sensor imagery for, for users to train and build their models. And then after some time, we released the entire scene and then asked the users to, well, now can you generalize, can you apply these models and, and kind of um, do inference right here? Okay, at this point, both of these data from both the blue and the red are available if you'd like to work with these. But this, this just showcases uh, a, a typical uh, problem that you would, that you would be analyzing uh, in, in the space, right? So you, you would either have ground truth or you would create ground truth from your, your domain expertise or the domain expertise of somebody who's, who can, who can under, infer from such images and label for you, give you labels. And then you would take that and then pair it with the data and then train models, right? And the goal is, can you now extend that to uh, other parts in that same scene or different regions, different cities. Can I build a model out of Houston and then train it in Atlanta or uh, Indiana or, and so on, right? So can, can you, can you uh, extend this uh, geographically? All right, now just continuing along the discussion of passive optical imagery and hyperspectral imagery. So this is the same campus. This is again, region near our campus. This is a data set we collected in 2013. Uh, it's a hyperspectral image cube that I'm showing here again with 15 ground cover classes. Um, and what you can see, so this is the hyperspectral cube, right? So for every pixel, you can imagine pulling out, if, if you pull out the vector in each pixel, you'll get a spectroscopic profile. And so what I show here on the right is the average spectra of the dominant uh, land cover classes here. Uh, so it's in this case, it's uh, at sensor radiance versus uh, wavelength in, in nanometers. So you can see that's the visible part of the spectrum near infrared. And then this is the near infrared, right? So you would basically be learning, do your, doing your learning in a vector space, right? If, if you're just modeling at the level of pixels or you'd be extracting patches and uh, for each patch, you'll have a collection of vectors um, that, that may look like this, right? And so you can see here that there, there is a fingerprint for, for the key types of land cover classes. You, you can see a very clear, distinct uh, spectra for the different classes, for, for at least a lot of the different classes. So that, that gives you an idea of the power that hyperspectral imagery can provide when you're doing land cover classification, right? And so uh, this is an example of the training and test data from the same image. I'm, I'm gonna come back to this later in this talk. Okay. All right, so in terms of uh, the, in terms of where this community kind of has, has um, has come uh, in, in terms of, so if you, if you look around what's going on, uh, for for geospatial image analysis, it's 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 safe to say it's pre, it's dominated by uh, various flavors of deep learning and and rightly so. But just to provide some uh, historical context, in, uh, going back maybe twenty years, right? So 
th this is kind of the uh, uh, trajectory that it's taken. Not this is don't don't take this literally. It's not like something started here and ended here. Just just approximate timeline of things, right? So uh, pre what what we would typically be doing is you you would basically do handcrafted features, right? You would extract handcrafted features and then. You, you try to find embeddings, uh, linear on, or nonlinear, that will embed your features in, in a space where you can then um, uh, train models on, right? And, and then uh, you can uh, represent these in, um, you, you can, for example, do manifold learning and, and learn the underlying manifold and use that as a representation. You could do kernel-induced spaces, so all the flavors of kernel-based algorithms uh, you you could you could pair a lot of these with um, model based and uh, Bayesian parametric and non parametric methods, and then uh, sort of a, a follow on to this was this notion that the data is inherently sparse in some domain, and can you learn that underlying sparse representation and use that as a basis for classification, right? And so that that became a thing and and, and showed promise. And then over the years, of course, um, people started uh, exploring uh, all sorts of flavors of convolutional recurrent and graph-based neural networks and, and saw that there's a lot of promise there in terms of being able to do not just the uh, uh, classification, but the feature extraction part as well, right? So it's basically a single thing that you can use to, to, to both do the, um, the, the feature extraction and the learning uh, in, in, in one shot, in, in one go. All right, so I'll now, some of you may be familiar with, uh, may have this background, but I'll still spend some time uh, just going over the basics. I may uh, go a little faster because I was told that the, the, the audience has some basic background in, in computer vision. So um, I, I'll, I'll try to keep this short, but I, I'll nevertheless just spend a little bit of time on this just, just for context. So introduction to deep learning. So uh, what, are the key, what are some of the key open challenges in machine learning for tasks such as classification, semantic segmentation, object detection, et cetera, right? And, and particularly in the context of geospatial image analysis. Well, like I said before, learning with limited data, right? Or uh, limited label data. And, and, and oftentimes uh, maybe noisy label data, so erroneous labels, for example. Learning with multiple sources, such as sensors. And, and, and very importantly, learning representations that are robust or invariant to what we can call nuisance factors uh, when you're trying to do analysis. So as an example, if you're doing speech recognition, uh, such nuisance factors could be uh, when I say nuisance, it's nuisance from the point of view of the algorithm, right? Uh, changes in speaker can, can change the statistics and kind of throw off the method uh, a bit. Uh, changes in volume, pitch, state of mind, and so on. In vision, computer vision, changes in relative geometry of the object, sources of illumination and the sensor and so on, right? In terms of geospatial imagery, uh, I'm going to pause for a, or for a few seconds and ask, uh, can somebody tell me uh, what could what such nuisance factors would be if you're trying to do geospatial image analysis? Look angle. That's that's an excellent uh, sun position. I'm, I'm looking at the chat window here. Those are all valid uh, nuisance factors. Clouds. Clouds illumination variability, atmospheric conditions, right? Uh, so all of these can, can, uh, can bring a great deal of variability um, when, you're, when you're doing image analysis, right? And so they have to be accounted for. And, and whatever models you're learning should be ideally be invariant to these to the extent possible. Okay. All right. Now, it turns out, uh, what people have observed over the years is that uh, you can indeed find representations that are sensitive to task-related features while being inv invariant to uh, such nuisance variability. 
In other words, you can indeed uh, disentangle representations that factor out this variability. Um, and, and there's a very interesting paper in 2012 uh, that, that talks about how uh, our brain can actually solve uh, visual object recognition while disentangling uh, these, these, uh, these nuisance factors. So I'm not gonna dwell on this paper. I'll, I've put this there if you'd like to dig deeper into this, but it basically suggests that uh, if, you, if you look at a uh, typical feed forward architecture, the AND-like operations uh, are equivalent to uh, basically learning strong representations, um, task specific, specific representations and the R-like op operations, just pooling kind of, um, allow you to do get some invariance to nuisance to, to nuisance parameters okay so that that was an interesting study which kind of looked at the neuro uh, neuroscience and, and and linked it to deep learning all right so what are neural networks well um, a, a simple example would be something like this that you would i presume you'd you'd have seen before and um, basically, the idea here would be, well, you can get very high expressive power uh, in, in a network like this, where you've got, and it, let's say you've got input layers and, and output layers, and so you've got input data coming into this network, and then you've got hidden layers, and at each node, you're basically representing whatever is coming in to that node. So imagine a fully connected, full connections between successive nodes, successive layers. So whatever is coming in here, you can now imagine a linear combination of, of those features and then um, squash that with an activation function, um, and, uh, which is typically nonlinear. And so now imagine doing this hierarchically. And so you can now build very good function estimators or function approximators uh, in, in, this, in this framework, right? <clears throat> so, and so that's that's the general idea. Right? And what you would typically do is uh, for, for a network like this, you would basically have, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip through some of the math. Uh, I think this is basic stuff and it's it's something that you would know, but I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about what you, how you do the training here, but so, so you'd have a loss function, right? Which in, in this specific example, I'm just considering an MSC type loss, you'll have some type of regularization on the weights that'll, that'll kind of uh, uh, help you in uh, decreasing the magnitude of the weight, promoting sparsity and such. And so what you do is you'd look at the loss coming out of the network, let me go back here and so, so during a forward, if you're trying to learn this model, so first of all, what are you trying to learn? You're trying to learn the weights and biases um, in these trainable layers, right? And so you, you would make a forward pass, look at what comes out here, and then you can propagate your gradients backwards. And so what, what I mean by that is, if you consider any, any one of these nodes and, and the parameters that affect it, the gradients of the loss with respect to these parameters tells you how sensitive your loss is to small perturbations in these values, right? So, and so if, if you have these gradients uh, with of the loss with respect to these parameters, you can then do something like gradient descent and optimize for these parameters, starting with some initialization, okay? And so, and, and then using the chain rule, you can propagate, you can backprop all the way to the to the beginning of the network, right? And and basically optimize for your para parameterization of this network. Okay, and and so in that context, so that's just gradient descent. Um, in in that context, you can you you can train a network, right? And so one thing to consider is well, what sort of nonlinearity would I use uh, as an activation? to each of these nodes. So people have studied several types, right? So for example, you can use something like the sigmoid or the tan H. And uh, both of these would squash data within a fixed range, okay? But you have to be sort of cautious or, or, or 
sort of wary of using these in general because the if you've got saturated neurons, um, th th there is uh, a possible a distinct possibility to kill gradients. Okay. Uh, specifically, sigmoid uh, is also not centered around zero, which can be an issue. Um, so, so that's things something to consider. Uh, having said that, there might be situations where this is appropriate to use. Uh, as a simple example, if you've got if you've got some intuition that tells you that your data should be within a certain range, right? Should be should be bounded between zero and one, for example. Um, th this may be appropriate to use, but subject to the caveat. Uh, of, of what I said here. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, people have find, found em empirically that uh, ReLU rectified a rectified linear unit, which looks like this, which is basically max of zero X, works reasonably well. Um, people often also use a leaky ReLU, which will basically, instead of just killing the neuron here, it will allow for a little bit of leak. And so the slope here wouldn't be zero, but just a very small value like that. Okay, so this is often a good choice um, in that because it converges much faster than the sigmoid or tan H in practice, and you don't run to these issues, um, saturation issues over here. Okay. So in terms of practical issues with such networks, well, uh, you'd have to do, uh, you'd have to initialize your uh, your your network right because because if you're doing gradient descent of or any flavor of gradient descent you would have to uh, start from somewhere so you you'd have to initialize all the weights and biases in the network to to something and and often it it will be a random initialization of network weights why is this important well it's it's really important actually because it it helps you break the symmetry so if you if you consider the previous art network architecture. If all the if all the parameters are initialized the exact same way and you start doing gradient descent, everything is going to start moving the same way, right? Because uh, because of the, the the way you initialize. So uh, by randomly initializing, you you break the symmetry uh, and and kind of help for a faster. You, you'd basically be able to learn. And so there there are there's been work that has studied empirically. Uh, what are the, the impacts of different types of initializations, whether you use a uniform distribution, normal dif distributions, and scale flavors of these. So in general, uh, uh, people use, uh, found that Xavier initialization um, is, is appropriate for tan H and sigmoid activation and the Hay weight initialization if you're using ReLU and, and the like. But there is some good work uh, that, that discusses these and the importance of initialization. Uh, that that I'd refer you to. <clears throat> okay, so the one thing I only casually discussed previously that I'll spend a bit more time on now is the loss function. So what do you optimize for, right? Um, what do you, what do you what are you trying to optimize, rather? So <clears throat> I I had kind of used this generic uh, loss previously, but let's look at the different possibilities. So first of all, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do classification, uh, then you would use something like a softmax loss, which you can pair with uh, a sort of a softmax with which you can pair with a cross entropy loss, right? Um, you could you could use a loss that looks like this, which is the max of zero and f j minus f y i, where j refers to an index of all other classes other than the true class for the ith sample. Uh, plus one. So this actually is a hinge loss and uh, is is equivalent to an SVM type. It, it, it has the same effect as a margin, as a normalized margin uh, that, that that if you've ever, if you, for those of you who've used SVMs would, would, would uh, appreciate. So basically what it's saying is uh, if, if you look at the penalty here uh, and you look at the difference in scores between the correct and the incorrect class, this is still where you're potentially correct, but you're introducing a uh, sort of margin. You're you're artificially you're creating a margin where you're saying this is a zone where I, I'm unsure, right? Around the boundary decision surfaces between classes. Um, so so this is often this is actually really commonly used, right? You you basically terminate a network with a soft max and use categorical cross entropy for the training. 
Um, in, in terms of regret, in, if you're doing regression where the output is not a discrete label, but is instead a value, a continuous value on the real line that you're trying to predict, then you'd use something like a, a mean squared error, uh, an L2 or an L1 norm of the true, uh, the, the prediction minus the true value that you have from the training data, right? Just a little word of warning. Uh, even though you can you can do reason, you can do pretty good prediction with neural networks in general. <clears throat> regression lo losses may you, you may find under situ certain situations that they are much harder to optimize compared to classification losses. Um, for example, they're very sensitive. They can be sensitive to outliers and have a fragile optimization. And a sort of an intuition behind that as well. You're you're trying to learn over a continuum, right? And so that 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 can, that can play part of how the network behaves for a loss like this. Okay. <clears throat> in terms of what goes in uh, to the network, just just talking about more practical considerations, right? So one of the things people often do when they send data into a network before they send data into a network to train, they're training. Um, uh, they would do some sort of normalization of the data, right? So a, a, it's it's not uncommon to see uh, that your data being uh, centered uh, so, uh, on the origin and then um, normalized to a certain dynamic range before you feed it to the network. And so th that's pretty common, right? You can do you can do mean subtraction and uh, normalizing uh, the, the, the dynamic range by looking at the standard deviation and normalizing for that. But, and then there are, the, there are of course, other, there, there are lots of flavors in which you can do this. You can scale for unit variance along each, along each uh, input dimension. Uh, you could do something like a PCA. You could do a whitening transformation that'll basically turn the covariance into an identity matrix and your blobs would now be spherical or hyperspherical uh, before your network sees it. But then what would you choose and why? And, and, and so the, the thing I want to stop here for a few seconds and ask is what, what do you think are the warnings or considerations you'd have to keep in mind when you do this, when you do some sort of normalization? Let's say if you're trying to use some of these, what are the issues you may be you may need to, to watch out for. Any thoughts on that? Outliers, okay. That's a good point. What, any any other? So let's, let's look at, just because, because I've seen this, like just do PCA uh, upfront and then do, uh, and then send the data to a network, right? Or or do a whitening transformation. Well, what a PCA we may lose features. Well, yeah, I mean that's you, you're you're on the right track. Um, you you may lose you may lose some information encoded in the features, right? Uh, piece, the the covariance structure comes it sort of is is in, may encode some interesting features in the data and so if you decorrelate with it with a pca transformation which it is it's a decorrelating transformation or if you white even worse if you whiten it uh in other words uh, sort of just uh totally changing ellipsoids to spheres and, and so on the relationship between the features is lost that's and I, and i see the answers in the text in the chat so that's that's correct so you've got to you've got to watch out for that, right? So if if just going back to our our hyperspectral or multispectral imagery example, if you are if you know that there's a certain correlation structure between bands that's very important to the analysis task at hand, I, I, it may not be a good idea to de decorrelate those features, right? So context matters, and so keep that in mind. So it may be useful under certain conditions. Uh, but it can also cause some headaches if if uh, if you don't if if you don't examine the context, okay. But it's it's nevertheless at the very least just centering the data and then scaling it within a certain range is perfectly reasonable, and it's it's often employed. And so that's at the input layer. Now, as you go through the network, right? People have found that during the training process, 
um, it's 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 a good idea to do uh, some sort of normalization of the activations so that your your data stays within bounds. Uh, and so that's that's very commonly deployed. So you you have something like a batch normalization. So this is the height and the width uh, sort of just squashed as a vector here. These are the number of channels. We'll see we'll see what this means in, a, in shortly. And then uh, these are the number of samples you have. So what batch normalization would do is for each node, it'll look at all the uh, for each layer rather. Uh, it, it'll it'll look at all the um, the data and then normalize it to let's say a a, the, a zero mean and a, a standard uh, variance. Okay, so that's commonly done, and it's found that, that it really improves um, the optimization of the loss function. That it, it helps with the training. Okay, um, the other thing that's deployed as a regularization is dropouts, <clears throat> and so the idea is well. Yes, you can learn for, for a neural network, you can learn this as it is, but alternatively, you can also consider uh, dropping out certain nodes during the training process. So in other words, uh, during certain steps of the training process, I may choose to kill certain nodes. In other words, those the probability of these nodes being used go to zero. Um, sorry, the, the probability of these nodes being used um, there's a certain probability that that's some of these nodes will will basically not activate. And once you do that, you can see that you end up using a smaller a subset of the network uh, during training, and that that can speed up things and and improve the optimization, in, in fact. And so, but the thing to consider here is what, so so when this is done, this is done only during the training part and during the different uh, runs different subsets may activate, okay? But the thing to watch out for is um, because you are suppressing certain nodes during training, you've got to make sure you scale up your output activations to account for that. So what's commonly deployed as an inverted dropout um, where that, that scaling is done for you. And so <clears throat> basically what it's saying is during a training pass, well, maybe these aren't perturbed, they kind of stay where they are and the other nodes, you kind of figure out, all right, which direction do I move in? And then at the next training pass, maybe some of these don't activate and the others go back and, and, and sort of take gradient steps. So that's the, that's the intuition behind this. Okay, kind of simplifies, uh, sort of breaks down the problem uh, a little bit and it makes it a little easier. Right. Now, convolutional networks. So, so let's let's start talking about convnets. Okay. And so the idea here is, well, instead of just uh, nodes that are taking li linear combinations of inputs and then activating them, let's let's look at structures specific to image processing. Right. So if you've got an image, you can consider uh, a, a and you consider a filter that you can convolve it with, right? Um, and then you can learn this filter as well, like in terms of what features it extracts, then that may be a, an excellent choice at each of these layers, right? And that's kind of the, the idea behind convnets is it's still a hierarchical feed forward type model, but what you're doing at each layer is you're convolving filters with images. And, um, and so at each layer, you may learn a, a series of filters and, um, and then, apply those filters on the image and then the activation is what you use to, to feed to the next layer and so on, right? So in this example, I've got five filters and I convolve that with this image and I'll, I'll get a stack of five, like a volume of five, that's five deep. And then the output is uh, at each of those points in the depth direction, I've got convolved activations of a filter with the image. So the key thing here is the filter now is the learnable parameter. That's what you learn now. Okay. Now I, I do want to sort of uh, I, I do want to mention there's a lot of details. I we can spend a lot of time on each of these topics. So this is more of a kind of overview discussion, and then uh, I'm just kind of highlighting the key points here. Okay. So one one thing you will uh, often see in in continent type architectures is well, so 
Um, you will take an image, you'll learn convolutional filters, you'll apply the convolution. So you might get features like these. You do the nonlinear activation. The activations might look like this, okay? And then you can recursively go, keep going. But something that's commonly done is to pool at various stages in this hierarchy, your image, your activations, the, the output feature maps. So what that means is, well, just it could be something as simple as just scaling down the features using something like a max pool, which is uh, just bringing down the spatial dimensions of the image and, and uh, sort of helping with some invariance uh, to translations and such. Okay. And so it's you can think of this as sort of keeping a tab on the degrees of freedom uh, that you feed feed to the next layer, right? And so that's the general idea. So a max pool, so let's say this is what this is what a max pool, this is the input to a max pool. And the way the max pool would work is it'll if it's a if it, if you're max pooling with by two, you basically uh, sort of at a stride of two, you look at each of these sets and then pick the maximum value and store that here, right? So that's what's going on here. You can see that. Okay. So things to consider in this setup. The, the, what are your design choices? Well, how deep can I go? How many filter kernels should I assign? How should I stride when I'm doing the convolution? Should I just move by one? Should I move by um, two, four, and so on? Uh, sh should I do pooling, right? Uh, and then, of course, if, if you want to keep your dimensions consistent, sometimes you may have to invoke padding and such. So these are all considerations to to uh, keep in mind, and and you'll see some of these issues when we look when we look at the examples uh, later in this presentation. But why is this useful? So well, the the idea is well, uh, the the filter. If you learn the filters, the filters might tell you something very interesting, right? So the, so people have looked at this, and especially in the context of image and just classical RGB type of image analysis. And, uh, and in terms of what they learn and what you see is very interesting. So the first, um, the, the first uh, in the beginning of, of, a, uh, of a convent, you will see that the types of filters that are learned are often very good at uh, discerning things like edges and so on. And then as you go deeper into the network, uh, you, you start learning features that are more semantically meaningful and, and sort of really useful for classification tasks. Okay, uh, just a quick history of, uh, or of, of networks as, they, as they've evolved in terms of, uh, of our convents or their flavors as they've evolved over, over the years. So this goes back to 1998, sort of one of the original uh, convent ideas where you basically not a, not a deep network, but again, something that you can recognize based on our discussions, right? It takes images, does convolutions, does downsampling or uh, pooling type operations, and then you hierarchically put this up with something that's that looks like what we would call a fully, a fully connected layer at the end. Okay. And then in uh, 2012, this is uh, what, what, of course, really uh, started showing promise in, in, in this direction. The AlexNet was uh, basically started taking that idea further. Uh, the the one thing that uh, don't get confused by these different streams that you see here. That's just a an artifact sort of. It it has to do with the GPU power that they had at that day. But it, they couldn't fit this into a single GPU, so they basically shared two GPUs. Uh, sort of got gotten this to work over multi over a pair, and so that's that's just some of the bookkeeping to to do with that. Uh, but again, sort of showing the uh, power of if you can now pair this with something like the ImageNet, you can start learning very interesting features, right? Uh, VGG16, basically, st you, you now start getting um, deeper networks. And then most recently, uh, well, not really, not when uh, sort of in this chain of events. Not not recent in, the, in in time, but they're still very commonly used. Is the idea of resnets, and so and 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 many of these flavors. And so the idea is well, instead of just a feed forward network like this, uh, right, and and just making it deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, what you can do is you can introduce these skip connections, and 
that really helps with optimization. So that was the empirical finding in all of the ResNet work. And so basically what they're saying is if, if, you, if you consider a network like this, which just has convolution pooling and you try to make it very, very deep, it may not optimize very well at all. And, it, and, and, the, intu and the other interesting finding was it's not just, oh, it's not overfitting. It's, it just doesn't optimize very well. Okay. And, and so the, what they then started doing was introducing skip connections. And the idea now is, well, instead of just learning the activation here, you are now learning a residual uh, between what you see in the input, right? Because so, so, so basically what this part is learning now is a perturbation to the input that you would then like to pass to the next layer and so on. Hence the name ResNet, residual network. And it empirically has now been shown over and over again that this really allows you to build really deep networks and, and um, do a great job in, in, with deep networks. And then you're able to optimize very well in this setup. Okay. <clears throat> so let me now sort of steer the discussion back to geospatial imagery. That was kind of just an overview from the computer vision world. Uh, of, of relevant networks. Uh, let me take back, let me put us back to in, in the train of thought of geospatial imagery, right? So a vast majority of the work or our developments have been made in the context of RGB uh, imagery. Now, uh, if you're looking at passive optical geospatial imagery, uh, a pixel level spectroscopic information is key to effective material characterization, right? Whether you're dealing with multispectral or hyperspectral imagery. I, I've kind of sh shown examples of this earlier today. Now, if you now think back to continents, any of the flavors of continents, uh, the question is how can you leverage multi-channel imagery in this space, in, in this context with such data, right? Now you can use 3D CNNs where this is especially true if you're dealing with hyperspectral imagery where the, the third direction is kind of over a continuum so you get spectroscopic profiles or you could use uh, 2D CNNs, but then how do you apply 2D spatial filters on a hyperspectral image cube? So does anybody have any thoughts on this? Okay, so if you're doing 2D CNNs, uh, and, and you want to apply a 2D CNN. All right, so I'm, I'm seeing some answers. So kernels can be applied on each band, Ex absolutely. You can, you can try to do that. The, the sort of thing to watch out though for is uh, how do you address, uh, how, how do you deal with the, the number of channels that you have, right? Because with hyperspectral imaging, those could be hundreds of bands. And so, uh, you, you can do that, or you could select, you could just strategically sample your bands, uh, or you could do some sort of embedding of the spectra. This is commonly done in the, in the community where you do, a, do an embedding of the spectra into a lower dimensional space and then work in that space. But then again, keep in mind, may not always be ideal, uh, but a possibility if that's appropriate for your task. Uh, the other thing to consider is if, if you have the, the classical CNN, the way that they're coded up, they would take the R and the G and the B, and then they'll sum up, they will kind of sum up the convolutions over those layers, right? So if you sum up over these channels, you're kind of averaging that information. So there are implementations of CNNs that will address channel separate, sort of separable convolutions, where you kind of keep the convolution of each channel separate. And that kind of goes along the lines of what uh, one of the answers I see here in chat that uh, kernels can be applied on each band. So just make sure you're doing separable convolutions, but then you've got a lot of data. You've got, you've got, you, you may have memory issues and, and such because your network, the, the number of trainable parameters may be very large. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the, the next practical question is if you're training, if you're trying to do ground cover classification, I'll just go back to this example, and you're trying to do training of a network. Uh, well, first of all, what's the end objective of such a task? The end objective is to be able to train on an image like this, and then for every pixel in a test image, be able to assign 
an integer label that maps it to one of the known classes, right? That's the general premise or, or the working principle that we are that, that we have. And so how would you train and test such a network? So one of the things you can do is that this is similar to sort of in, in speech recognition, if you have a sliding window, right, that you take across the signal and you study that window, uh, you can consider a, a window around each pixel and consider that window as the frame that you will train on and a similar window for every pixel in the test. You can, uh, you can build a frame and then test, get a test label and then assign that test label of that frame to the center pixel. So you can, you can do that. Okay, so the training may involve something like extracting patches. So if this is my training uh, region, uh, for every class, I can start pulling out patches uh, or, or windows of a certain size. Now, keep in mind, if you're dealing with a hyperspectral image, this is a, this is a cube. So there's a z-axis, there's a third direction here as well. And, and the, so, so you'll keep that as x, which is your data, and a corresponding label that you have from the ground truth. Okay, I just show a few just, just to keep things clean, but you would of course do extract as many patches as you can, right? And then train your network based on these patches and associated labels. And then at test time, what you can do is you can now take a window, like I said, around every pixel and then start sliding it across the entire image, right? So you can do that over the entire scene. And as you're doing that, you can send that frame to the network, to a trained network, get a label, assign it to the center pixel. And that way you'll get a classification map, a land cover map that you can use. Okay. <clears throat> any issues and considerations with this approach? Are there any thoughts on that? So let me let me say this: in, in the computer vision world, this something like this may be a no-no, right? You may not want to do this ever uh, if you're trying to do uh, classification or uh, pixel-level classification, right? And and the reason or the context there is uh, you're trying to Im you're you're in, you're trying to classify or analyze images, and oftentimes uh, lots of images, and oftentimes you're trying to do that at video rate. It's exactly it's time consuming. It's costly, okay. But in the context of a geospatial image, you you typically your task is here's a large scene, a couple of hundred by a couple of thousand pixels, maybe. Can you do inference? It's it's not that costly in that context. You it may take you like ten or fifteen minutes, right, uh, to to just run the inference on on something like this. So that's that's one of the differences. If if you're trying to do things video rate at thirty hertz, this is absolutely not a good idea. Uh, but if if all you care for is at the end of the day, I, I get a map uh, that's inferred that that's based on my training model by just looking at a small window around each picture, it's it's reasonable to do. Um, okay. Now, but there are some other considerations as well. How do you decide what's the right size of a patch relative to the image resolution and object size? Right. Or or even sort of taking that further. Can you have variable size patches instead of just fixed pat patches, right? And so these are things that people have started looking into. And, and, and so even in the RGB world, there are like things like inception modules where you can look at multiple window sizes and um, or uh, sort of even when you're doing the co convolution, right? You, you, you do it multi-scale. And so the, the sort of on, along similar lines, you can consider this, okay? It might it might make your network a little bit more complicated, but it's it's a possibility, okay? <clears throat> so, in the context of uh, geospatial imagery um, and and CNNs, you can do something. I'll just sort of just uh, repeat what I said, but in the context of geospatial imagery now, right? And so. If, you, if you're building convolutional networks with convolutional and pooling layers in a hierarchy that terminate to a fully connected layer, you can take a cube, you can either strategic, strategically sample the bands or find an embedding, or as was suggested here, if, if the resources allow you to, you can do a channel by channel, uh, sort of you can just take all the channels and then feed them and, and do channel specific convolutions and, and, and start going that way. 
right? Uh, and, and then take a sliding window and, and for each window, sort of put, put a, uh, a convolutional kernel, filter it and, and so on. Okay, so you could do this, right? Uh, the, the one thing I have not mentioned of, um, is you could also look at the spectral direction and you can either represent that with one dimensional CNNs or sequence models like recurrent networks and LSTMs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but that's, that's a possibility because at the end of the day, a spectra is you can think of, a, I mean, a spectra as a time series. So you can apply um, sequence models to it. Uh, in, in, in our work, we have found it's not, when you're trying to do that, it's, it's a little bit useful, but it's not like significantly useful. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm not d delving on that much. They're, they're a lot more useful in the context of time series analysis. And in fact, Professor Crawford is going to be covering some of those aspects uh, for prediction for, uh, in, in, in our part. Okay, so that's an example of, well, you, the other alternative is instead of a sliding window, you can just take a pixel, look at the spectra and do sequence modeling, either, either with just recurrent networks or with a combination of one dimensional CNNs that, that apply on the spectra and pair them with recurrent networks. Okay, now the, the alternative, now going back to images and frames is instead of 2D CNNs, you can now use 3D CNNs where for each window, your convolutional uh, operations are happening at the level of cubes and your filter kernels are now cubes, okay? So each convolutional operation here may be a convolution of a filter, a, a cube-like filter kernel with the what came in from the layer before, okay? Now, in, in theory, this is useful. This can be useful, but it gets a little overwhelming because now the number of sort of degrees of freedom explode right you've got you've got the z axis uh, over which you've got filter parameters as well and so the number of trainable parameters that you can have is very large and it's not it, there's no guarantee that you can find appropriate filters along the spectral direction if you do this or having said that we still find that if you run 3d cnns on something like a cube like hyperspectral imagery they work reasonably well okay but keep in mind like there is a chance, I mean, because because you're really taxing the system now. You've got you you've got a uh, lot more parameters to contend with. <clears throat> so there's a chance you may run into trouble there. All right, here's here's an sort of example outcome. Okay, so <clears throat> the blue here, I believe, is the training, and the red is the test to just to get an accuracy estimate. And so if we, if we start putting training if you start putting windows around these training patches and then uh, take a sliding window around the entire image and then label each pixel based on one of the 15 classes in this data set, you'd, you'd get a product that looks like this, right? So this is showing you if you just use a spectral, if you just use the raw spectra and pair it with something like an SVM, if you just take the raw spectra and pair it with a 1D CNN versus a 3D CNN. You can see that when you start doing a 3D CNN, uh, since you're incorporating spatial context and spectra at the same time, you get a smoother looking result uh, and, and kind of you have that spatial context. Uh, okay, now this is what I was talking about in terms of free parameters. Uh, I'd like you to focus on the 2D versus 3D here in this discussion. So in, 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 my, in this experiment, the 2D CNN was applied to 16 principal components of a hyperspectral image. So 144 spectral channels of a hyperspectral image uh, became 16 channels uh, through PCA, and then those were fed to a 2D CNN architecture. And so as you start adding layers, uh, you, 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 you will, of course, uh, see something like this. But then for each number of layers, a 3D CNN, you can see uh, you, you'd have to contend with a lot more degrees of freedom and trainable parameters, right? So this could this could be an issue, especially if you don't have a lot of data to train with. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you if you train on uh, blue and test on red, right? In terms of accuracy estimates, this is what you get. Okay. So one D CNN for this task, you get about sixty five percent. Two D CNN about 72, uh, 71 .5, 73. 
and then recurrent networks uh, somewhere in that range. Okay. Uh, alternatively, what you can do, and let me go back here, is you can just combine all the red and the blue here into a single mask. And this is what I see uh, people sometimes do. And I wanted to bring this to your attention and, and sort of highlight this point is what you can do is if you ignore the red versus blue, just treat all of these labeled patches and then randomly draw patches, uh, training patches from these, train a network, and then randomly draw test patches and test the network with those patches. Here is what here is the same network behaving uh, like that, uh, behaving for a setup like that. And you can see what happens, like the 65 becomes 88, 71 becomes 93 and so on. So let me ask in the audience, what do you think is happening here? If I, instead of, instead of sort of spatially separate patches or patches that are as spatially separate as possible uh, are drawn as spatially separate as possible, I just randomly pick them up from, from this collection of labeled data. Why, why do my accuracy suddenly start looking so nice? <laughs> it's just so much better. Any thoughts? Neighborhood pixels are highly correlated, exactly. So that's that's exactly what's going on here, right? And so you you will have situations where your data that's sitting right next to each other, you're training on this patch, but then you're testing on something that's right next to it, highly correlated. Uh, the chance of that working re really well is, is, is pretty high. So this is almost like training error, sort of training accuracy that you're looking at here. Okay, so keep that in mind. I mean, even though you'll see some work like this, uh, this is something that you should be careful of. Even if you are doing your own analysis, setting up your own networks, uh, if, if at all possible, please see if you can separate your training and test data uh, to, to the extent possible. Otherwise, you would never know how good your model generalizes, even to small distances. You can see this is not a huge shift, and still the accuracy kind of falls that much. So you will have no idea of how the network generalizes if you just randomly sample from within the same scene. Uh, okay. <clears throat> That's just quantifying that uh, over, well, we did a little study of, for the same problem. It will, I mean, if you increase the number of patches, um, you, you see, sorry, if you increase the path size over which you're studying your, your over which you're doing the training and testing, uh, you'd see you can actually get really, really high accuracies when you randomly sample because, and that's because as the path size increases, the overlap or the between highly, highly correlated patches becomes so much that uh, it's it's almost as if you're looking at the training accuracy instead of the test accuracy at that point. Okay. Uh, let me look at the time. Okay. Now, another thing you can do, I'll, I'll briefly discuss this, is you can, you can uh, with hyperspectral imagery, your z-axis, the spectral direction, is, a, is, is basically, you can think of that vector space and the pixels on that vector space as living in some manifold. Right? Now, that also means you can, in principle, look at something like graph-based convolutional networks. Uh, which operate on spectral graph convolutions and uh, try to represent, try to find feature representations based on this idea. Okay, so towards that end, we had studied uh, sort of graph-based CNNs for modeling spectral data and then combining it with traditional CNNs uh, sort of either through uh, feature fusion or decision fusion. And we can see that there is indeed a unique uh, sort of uh, feature, the unique set of features that you can learn with GCNs that you can pair with CNNs uh, if you're trying to do such analysis. Uh, a key thing here is how do you construct the affinity matrix when you're doing graph convolutions? And that kind of is really what everything boils down to at the end of the day. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but um, you're welcome to read these and ask me any questions later if you have on this topic. 
Okay, now I have a few slides on uh, semantic segmentation, but I recognize that the previous talk was also on this. So I will go through this a little fast, um, but you can stop me if you want me, uh, if, if you want to, but uh, again, keeping in mind that the, the, you just heard about some of this, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So if you think about what we are trying to do with uh, ground cover classification, at the end of the day, it's pixel level classification. And so it's akin to what's commonly in, in the community, especially in the computer vision community, also referred to as semantic segmentation, right? And so an alternative approach to doing what we just saw is to use something like semantic segmentation networks, where you, uh, so if, if you think of just the left piece of this, right, of a network like this, this is what a traditional classifier would do. It'll take an image, start running a hierarchy of convolution and pooling and lights and the lights. And, the, and, and then at the end of the day, you'll get some features that are semantically meaningful to the task at hand. However, because of all the pooling operations uh, and, and, and the sort of downsampling through convolution and pooling, you have lost any localization in the, in the image. Now, we have circumvented that in our previous approach because you are not doing this at the level of the entire scene. You are doing it at the level of a, of a sliding window, of a small sliding window, right, over which you approximate that that's my sort of, the window size is, is about the size of what the, the stationarity for that object class would, would tell you to, that's appropriate. Okay. Now, what you could do if you want localization, so in other words, in this example, the, the, you, you may get out, all right, this is an image of a dog, but where is the dog here, right? So you could consider a deconvolution network, which is now going to reverse this operation and uh, start unpooling uh, and give you an output space that's a similar dimension as the input space. And then once you do your training here, you can actually get localization as well. Okay, so not only is this, the, this is a dog, where is the dog, right? So answering the where question. So this is an alternative strategy you can use, and that's within the umbrella of semantic segmentation, right? Now I had referred to the unpooling here, right? So you can go back up a couple of different ways. You can do unpooling, or you can use transpose convolutions or also referred to as deconvolutions. So, in fact, let me let me stop here for a minute. And if if this is something that was covered in the previous talk, I can kind of breeze past it. Uh, unless I hear otherwise, I'll keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. So now, if you're doing pooling. You're basically taking an image or, or a feature map, and then uh, for every four by four here, you're picking the max, right? If just, that's max pooling in this example. Now, what you can do is you can store the location where the max was in the forward, is, sorry, in, in, this, in the convolution piece. And then in the deconvolution piece, you can look at that switch variable that tells you where uh, the max was, and then you can place the max pooled value over here and then fill the rest with, for example, zeros. Okay, and then you can do this uh, everywhere and that gives you a, uh, that gives you an unpooled layer of, of a similar dimension right as right here. And then this this basically gives you uh, this 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 gives you localization as well. Right. And then you can do the same with convolution. You can have a so in the convolution you've got a filter kernel that's moving around the image taking dot products. Now, in a in a transpose convolution, you kind of reverse that process, and um, you'll basically now get a a again an output map that'll start starting from here. You'll get an output map that looks similar in, in shape to what was fed into the convolution piece. And so you start you you're going to be able to reconstruct localization as you'll see momentarily uh, when you do this. So this is an example of an input image. Okay, and then I'll I'll pick one of these because we don't have to go through all of them, but let's pick I and J. Okay, so I is the two twenty four by two twenty four unpooling layer, and the last two twenty four by two twenty four deconvolution layer. 
So if you do this, you can act actually, uh, so if, if this was sort of towards the end of your convolution network, at the end of the deconvolution network, you can now construct back sort of exactly where the wheels were in this example, right? Where the edges were. And, and so that gives you a localization uh, pathway to, do, to, 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 to figure out where this came from. Now, uh, the pooling is a little bit, is, is a lot more sparser than the deconvolution. And so that's, that's the benefit of deconvolution is sometimes you'll get, you'll get a better characterization of uh, the features that you're recovering uh, in, in addition to the localization. Whereas in the pooling, you're kind of just looking at the uh, key, key uh, edges and such. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, in the unpooling. Okay. Now this is this this idea was exploited in the UNET architecture, which has become really popular and, and promising over the years. Uh, kind of originated in the biomedical domain, showed a lot of promise there. And now it's very commonly utilized in geospatial imagery as well, where you would basically have that same architecture. So this is like the convolution piece, and then this is the deconvolution or the upconvolution or the transpose convolution piece. Okay. And so you can think of this right here as the semantic pathway. This answers the question of what are you looking at? But then what the unit does is to facilitate better learning, it also creates sort of skip-like connections between the last layers here at each level with the corresponding layers going up in the up convolution or the transpose convolution stream. Now, I in this specific diagram, they're actually, yeah, they're doing up convolution here. Uh, and not unpooling, which you can do unpooling too. Um, and so <clears throat> you're basically, this pathway is the localization pathway, which tells you, all right, coming in, I saw based on the, the features here that the, this is where the edges are. So this is where I think the object is. And so it kind of supplements that with this pathway, the semantic pathway, and you get the best of both worlds. Okay, now another interesting idea here, is uh, this idea of uh, adding attention gates uh, when you're doing units. And attention modules have really increased in popularity and, and they're, they're shown to be really promising over the years. And the idea is, well, uh, can I have le learnable gates that tell me where to pay attention, that tell the network where to pay attention? And it turns out in a unit type scheme, you can put these attention gates when you are bringing things over from the convolution side to the deconvolution side, right? So it tells you, hey, uh, can the network figure out uh, by where to pay attention to, wh what part of the image to attend to, okay? And that's what this pathway can potentially help you with, with the, the attention gates. And they're not just common here now, they're used in all sorts of network architectures, right? And I do list some references where some of these ideas have now started being used in, in geospatial imaging as well. Okay, let me show you an example of attention uh, units. So this is an this is a biomedical application. So trying to detect pancreas, and over over training epochs, you can see that so this is kind of a heat map of a heat map of where the attention is being made. You can see that a lot of attention is over, over training. You can see that attention is indeed put over the right place where you want to be, but this is learned by the network. Okay. This is an example with geospatial imagery uh, where you're trying to do attention um, in, in this architecture. And you can see that there's a lot of attention being play, paid to uh, the airplane class, which is what was of interest here. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to mention or, or spend a little bit of time on is uh, meta learning. This is an interesting, this is a very interesting topic uh, that I think has a lot of uh, synergy and sort of opens interesting possibilities with geospatial data analysis, right? So in, in the computer vision world, uh, the, the idea of meta learning is, is, um, is explained as follows. So uh, models that not only learn from data to perform tasks, but learn how to learn to perform tasks through experiencing tasks on a variety of data sets. Okay, so if you can consider a uh, meta training library where each, which, which is comprised of several tasks, 
where each task is a certain type in this example is a certain type of uh, classification task that you're looking at uh, can you learn a model that learns how to learn over this ensemble of tasks such that when you give it a new task it can very quickly learn from it so it's like it's it's it, intuitively it's like can you make a network learn how to do good fine tuning quickly right and and kind of uh, go from there so uh, the idea is to use plentiful of other previously seen tasks to learn how to learn and then learn the new task more efficiently from small amounts of data okay so sort of umbrella terms or, or related concepts would be few shot learning and so on okay so the the difference between supervised learning traditional supervised learning and supervised meta learning is in supervised learning, what you're saying is given some data set and some labels, can I find a mapping that takes me from the data to the labels, right? Whereas in supervised meta learning, what you're saying is given, given an ensemble of labeled tasks in my training data, so D train, and it, it test image or a test sample from a different task. Can I find a label now? Okay, so you're you're basically saying I I not only have a little bit of data from this task, but I also have sort of historical knowledge of these other tasks and how the network learn on those tasks. Right, and so there's a lot of ways you can set this up. And what I'll do is, in the interest of time, I will focus on one of those ways. So. I'll, I'll mention some of these ways so you can you can have what is okay let me let me just set up mathematically the problem though first right so in a in a gen, generic learning problem you're trying to find network parameters that are that are minimizing over some loss function given a training data set okay now in a generic meta learning problem you're trying to find some network parameters that are minimizing an ensemble of loss functions each for one for each task okay and and you can keep in mind there might be that the network parameters might be separate for each task okay uh such that if you see new test data you can quickly learn from it okay so the the one way to think of this and i will kind of switch to that i'll just so there's a couple of different ways and you can do this you can use sequence models to do what's called black box meta learning. Uh, you can use something like prototypical networks for this. But the one that I will talk about here uh, is what is referred to as gradient based uh, meta learning. And a very interesting and uh, sort of insightful work uh, on along these lines is um, by Finn and all. And it's, it's called model agnostic meta learning or MAMO. Okay, and this kind of the seed for a lot of these ideas. Uh, for, for for gradient based so basically what you can think of now is if i've got a couple of different tasks and the theta is my parameter vector that you are optimizing for right can i learn this theta in a way that on an average does the best sort of in some average sense over all the tasks i have seen okay and so such that if a new task comes along it'll 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 do reasonably well it can reasonably well adapt to that task okay now there's a lot there's a lot more detail here than i provide here but that's the general idea and basically this is done through uh through two uh, steps so you can think of like you you can have a a gradient update that just looks at the loss of, of the network with respect to the network parameters and the training data but then you you can have a, a an update that has an alpha learning rate and a beta learning rate and the beta learning rate basically now looks at the test data for each of those tasks and optimizes the great optimizes the parameters such that you have the least possible loss between the training and the test and then you do this over all the tasks okay so the alpha is specific to a specific task and then the beta is specific to all the tasks in an average sense and the thing that you're trying to address is well can can the thing that you learn here 
do reasonably well with your test data. And so if you, if you do your gradient descent like this, it's equivalent to traversing in an average sense in along a path in the feature in the parameter space that gives you a network that's reasonably well generalizable. The assumption is that for any new task that comes along, it's drawn from a similar distribution. Okay. And so if I get a new task, it will be approximately similar in, in, in the sense of maybe uh, from the same distribution. And in that case, this theta that you've learned through this process is approximately, it's, it's going to be good enough. It's going to do a good job there. That's, that's the idea. Okay. Now, how does this fit into our scheme of things in, in terms of geospatial analysis? Here's a very interesting uh, paper out of uh, the 2020 uh, CVPR workshops. And so this is this basically is on meta learning for few shot land cover classification. And so the idea is, well, can the different if if you got it if you got a lot of data spanning the globe, for example, you could be doing a classification task or a segmentation task. Remember, this is fairly general. I, I did not specify a certain type of loss. You could do this, you could use this for regression, for classification, semantic segmentation, and so on. Okay. Uh, the, the only requirement here is that you're uh, that when you're doing the gradient descent, you're able to, to compute second order derivatives, which which most packages can. Okay. And so, in, in the context of geospatial imagery, what you can do is you can uh, you can consider different regions to be tasks, and and these tasks encode variability. Uh, in in the simplest case just from different regions, from different geographic regions, from different sensing conditions, seasons, and so on, right? And so if you can train a network over a large collection of these tasks and then apply it to different regions, you can use a mammal-like idea to, to, to uh, do this meta-learning. So that's, that's a very interesting concept here, okay? Now, another thing you can do is you can do transfer learning, right? And so the question is, what can what can vary in a geospatial image analysis setup? And I've I've mentioned this previously several times, right? So I'll I'll just say, well, you can you can sense from different platforms, right? The geometry of where the sun is relative to where your sensing can be different, right? And so all of these can can give you a collection of images that you'd have to um, train and test on, and so. Being able to learn, do some transfer learning in this setup is is fairly useful. Okay, now you can do in the context of networks, you can do this really simply uh, using some sort of pre-training and fine-tuning. All right, I'll pre-train a network based on some domain, maybe one of these sensors or one of these um, platforms, and then I'll test, I'll fine-tune a little bit or all of that network on when my conditions change. All right now, it's a very simple approach, and it's not going to do significantly well, especially if the variability or the type of data is very different, but that's a starting point, right? Now, this is showing a practical use case of transfer learning. So this is data we acquired as part of, as part of a NASA project where this was an aerial image over coastal wetlands. It, it's a hyperspectral image, okay? And then this is sort of street view imagery we acquired from a hyperspectral camera along that same wetland over some of the key uh, species, uh, vegetation species that we were trying to track in, 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 in both of these images. You can see the spectra looks very different, right? One is calibrated reflectance, one is at sensor radiance, okay? Uh, one goes up to sphere, one stops at uh, sort of veneer, uh, a near, and um, so, so you, you, you've got to contend with all of that in the transfer learning setup. Okay, so what you can do is, you can do all sorts of transfer learning. There, there are many, many approaches. And again, in the interest of time, I'll just keep it brief here. Uh, the one idea you can use is you can try to find mappings that map your source domain, which you can think of as one of these sensors that you're trying to train from, and a target domain, which is maybe the sensor that you want to do inference on, but maybe don't have a lot of label data to train from. You can find mappings that take you from the source domain to the to some latent space and a target domain to that same latent space, such that when you do this, you can train using all of this rich label data here and then apply that to data over here, okay? And so that's one of the ideas that one of my former students, Sean, developed. And we, you, you can also take that and apply that to networks and align network layers 
And you can see you can do a pretty good job at aligning uh, across different types of sensors in terms of overall accuracy. Okay. This is showing the alignment of features using TSNE. <clears throat> As you go through the network, we're just trying to align feature layers. Okay, uh, you, you can do some, you, you can invoke GANs, you can use GANs for uh, transfer learning as well. Now GANs have been really uh, promising for uh, image synthesis, where you can, it's basically like a min-max problem where you can uh, try to generate images from noise using a generator network, uh, such that they fool or attempt to fool a discriminator network that tells that can tell from fake versus real images, right? And so if this is trained correctly at the end of the day, you'll have very good realistic looking images. So this is very useful for data augmentation. If you don't have a lot of data, you can synthesize data to train networks, right? You can also set this up in an adversarial uh, sort of uh, domain adaptation way, where instead of noise coming in, uh, you could have a target domain data here and a, a source network here. And now what the generator is trying to do is it's trying to align deep features from the target so that they start looking more and more like deep features from the source. And that's something that we did in, in a uh, previous work and uh, this shows some of that. But this is building footprint extraction uh, from, from NAPE to SpaceNet. And this is the ground truth. And this is what happens if you do no knowledge transfer, you miss a lot of buildings, but then as you start doing knowledge transfer with adversarial learning, you can pick up a lot of the uh, buildings back, okay? This is the same idea applied to multi-temporal data, bit, uh, hyperspectral imagery between two time points. And you can see you can do a reasonably good job of alignment um, using, using GAN. So there's a lot of open problems here that we are actually still actively investigating and working on. So that's another interesting area um, that's coming together. Okay, so that's it from my side. Let me finish by some concluding remarks. So based, uh, so there are many exciting directions and interesting problems that remain and that need uh, more exploration, both algorithmic and application focused in the space of uh, single and multi-spec uh, sensor GOAI. Um, Keep in mind that the, the, the network design choices should be driven by the nature of the problem, right? And context is important and should ideally, it, sh it should inform your design choice where possible. So if, if at all possible, see if, if, you're, if you're trying to uh, take some of these ideas and apply to your problem, uh, see what are the requirements of your problem, what are the assumptions in your problem and how you can use those to make design choices. I think that's, that's really useful. Um, if you have any questions outside of the school, I mean, if, if questions come later, if you can feel free to email me, and that's my email address. Uh, just a little plug for an advertisement. I have a couple of PhD positions in the area of uh, machine learning, sparse representations, uh, data fusion, and deep learning for GeoAI in my lab. So if that's of interest, um, you may reach out to me. And with that, I will hand it over to Professor Crawford for part three, uh, part two. So th thank you, Saurabh. Um, could I share my screen? Maybe if you could, uh, yes. all right. Okay, can you see my screen in presentation mode? Uh, we see the slides, uh, like the, the PowerPoint app. So you don't see the, the full screen in presentation mode? Let me try to stop sharing and share again. It says you can see my application, but can you see it in you, you see it now. We see okay, it now. Okay, great. It took just a minute. I think maybe it's the distance. All right. Well, thank you so much, Saram. Um, my part of this presentation is going to relate to some applications of some of the things that Saurabh talked about. 
Um, as he said, I'm Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and my email is listed here in case you want to uh, speak with me at some point in the future. And please, if you have questions, uh, let me put um, the chat up as well, just to, so I see if I if you have anything that's coming in, if I have anything that's, you know, during the presentation. So the first thing I want to do is um, I want to address some issues that are really important in developing machine learning models, and it's in the context of applications. So listed here, and I'll go through some of them in greater detail, is uh, the uh, issue of domain understanding. You know, we often are very, very uh, intent on developing our uh, algorithms, and we want to take some data, particularly if it's data that's been provided by someone else, and just use it and demonstrate that we have done better. And there are some problems with this, particularly in the application domain. I also want to reinforce some of the things that uh, Dr. Prasad talked about relative to setting up your experiment and specifically relative to sampling your data. I'll refer more briefly to um, issues related to high dimensionality. We tend to um, do some off the shelf types of things and I want to talk about that a bit more. Limited ground reference data is a real problem. You know, I had someone tell me, no matter how much you publish, um, the thing that's more important is the data you provide to the community um, because uh, the reference data is difficult to get. And uh, and people really are not enthused about doing that. Uh, it either involves annotation uh, of imagery or going into the field and actually acquiring the regular the real data. And finally, there's issues with heterogeneous environments uh, within the area within which we are developing, um, you know, um, a model. Then you may have variability, and it could be associated with um, clouds, as was said in, uh, earlier, in one part of the scene, and or not. It could be associated with different properties, associated with maybe the ground, uh, soils, for example. Then I'm going to go into a couple of case studies uh, related to object detection. Uh, Dr. Sara uh, Prasad earlier mentioned that, uh, um, you know, object detection, and he referred to it in a in um, couple of his uh, um, examples. And I'll give a couple of specific examples here. Uh, because this happens to be a topic of great interest writ large, not really just related to uh, remote sensing of, of um, geospatial data, but, uh, you know, counting uh, people, counting uh, all kinds, cars, all sorts of things like that. Well, it's also utilized in agriculture, and you might find some of these applications interesting. And then I'll talk about uh, a couple of case studies related to prediction, and that's just to augment what was said earlier relative to um, classification, because these networks can also be used for prediction. So, um, you know, one of the things that the most popular data sets has ever been utilized is one uh, from uh, Indiana. It's from a couple of miles from where uh, the, the university resides, and it's called the Indian Pines data. And I say it's not what you think. And this is related to domain knowledge. Let's look down here at this list of classes. So you have corn no-till. Well, most people who are working in our domain don't even have any idea what um, no-till means. Uh, and it also may be corn, and depending on how it's been set up um, in the data set you got, it might say corn min, corn max, corn, um, you know, low, high, et cetera. Well, um, this is what it really looks like. So if you were to look at this image up above, this data was acquired in order to um, evaluate tillage experiments, which has to do with the amount of residue on the ground. It was acquired in June. The plants are very small. You almost don't even see them. So in the way the ground reference data was acquired was driving around, all right, and a hand um, developed map uh, indicated with you know rough shapes of the fields, uh, what the fields were, uh, corn, soybeans, et cetera. And so, you know, this was what the, it's a rough background in terms of the, the uh, actual reference data, but it's not uncommon. Another thing I'd like to point out in any kind of application, now this happens to be agriculture, but in other data sets that might be, let's say for urban areas, 
you have this field here. The ground reference data looks like it's a co totally continuous set of, 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 of points that are, are the same. But when you classify this, the pixel values are definitely going to be different. And I have seen people spend lots of time trying to get rid of this so that they make it match this. Whereas in reality, this is really different. It has to do with a grass uh, patch it's a, um, that is used for um, water um, movement through the field. So try to understand what you're dealing with um, and, and utilize that to your best advantage. Okay, now I'm moving on in terms of sampling approaches for selecting models and, and then evaluating them. There's some standard kind of approaches that are used and these are particularly important for um, data that are where you have limited reference data. Um, the, you know, historically, one of the most widely used is this holdout method, K-fold cross-validation, where you separate or partition your data into subsamples is widely used. This is important, not just uh, for to actually select the model in terms of which of these sets does, you know, poorly or, or well, but to understand the variability uh, and what it comes from, because you can have some anomalous data in your uh, reference data. And so that helps you determine really what data should go into that training data and then uh, be utilized later. And bootstraps, of course, are uh, where you select uh, the sample with the um, samples by random sampling with replacement. So just keep that in mind. More and more of the deep learning uh, papers are not doing this rigorously. And a part of it is they have lots of data. So let's say you're just using ImageNet or the Cocoa data set. There's huge amounts of data. And so you um, often can don't have to worry so much in those cases of, about these anomalies because you have so much data. But it's really important uh, when you have small amounts of data and you will have small amounts of data if you are acquiring the reference data yourself in many cases. Now you may also need to stratify the, the um, the data sets in terms of your um, data that's used for training and for testing, uh, because they may be unbalanced, all right? You may have um, data that's, you know, totally unequal in terms of the quantity under different conditions. You may have situations where you have experiments that have replicates, and you don't want one to be in the training and one to be in the test. That's really creating, you know, that uh, an unfair bias in the positive direction. Um, it was already noted that you don't want to select spatial neighbors in image patches because that also biases your results. And there are also issues with temporal uh, data because the data, if you think about this, if you have a sequence of temporal data and you're studying the phenomena over time, then if you randomly sample from each of the data sets, then you're not taking into account the interaction over time associated with um, the geospatial location. So keep those things in mind. High dimensionality is a problem that we deal with in hyperspectral data or multimodality sensing. And um, the, so the approaches that are used are either feature selection or feature extraction. And our community has um, moved toward feature extraction because it I, you know, basically allows you to uh, utilize the whole data set on the other hand, you have no explainability. So um, you actually you know, project the original data into a new space, but you may have irrelevant information as well as, um, that it, as the data that the information you really want that's gonna be incorporated into the, the features. Feature selection is going to provide typically a more meaningful set of uh, features that are going to be a subset of the original. Um, but on the other hand, you know, this is essentially, if you do it right, an optimization problem, and, and it could be a very large integer problem. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about more, uh, more about this in uh, one of the applications. So limited ground reference data we've already talked about, and these three approaches were already um, mentioned by Dr. Prasad. Um, data augmentation, where you might do simple things like flipping and rotating uh, your reference data, but the data need to have a relevant spatial pattern in order for that to actually um, you know, be useful. And historically, active learning has been a strategy that's been used. And so that's coming back into, um, I would say, in, uh, in, uh, more interest recently. And this is where you identify additional data 
with. And this happens in transfer learning. If you're going to ad- acquire some additional data in the new target domain, you want to do it in a way that's imp- that's going to provide relevant information. And so we can build on the historical work on this in classical machine learning. And then finally, GANs, with, uh, which are uh, synthesizing, i.e. simulating um, the problem at hand. Um, And then finally, if you have heterogeneous environments, and there's a wide range of scenarios in which um, transfer learning might be utilized, and I'll talk about one or two of those later. Okay. There. Okay. So... um, The applications I'll talk about are twofold in agriculture. One is in plant breeding. So I want to give you a little bit of background. So what people do in plant breeding, and this is the same in any kind of genetic um, uh, experiment. What you want to do is you produce genotypes, various hybrids, And you want to then determine which are the best of them. Now, in an agricultural sense, maybe you're concerned about heat and drought tolerance. Maybe you're concerned about standability, uh, different kinds of uh, characteristics. Now, what you have is the um, variety. What's produced is going to be dependent on the genetics. But what you uh, it's also going to be in a given environment. And so that's going to impact the outcome. And further, the management practices. And what we mean by management practices in this case would be uh, irrigation, um, nutrient application, et cetera. So the combination of all of that gives you the phenotype. And that's what you're measuring in the field. And so um, the part that's the easiest, ironically, is the genetics, because you can now sequence the genome very quickly and fairly inexpensively. Um, so that's not the biggest problem, but it's this combination that's a problem uh, in terms of sorting out what's giving you the measurement. Now, historically, these phenotypes have been measured directly, people going into the field, doing lots of um, measurements by hand. And I'll show you a graphic here. All right. So you can see students and faculty um, making measurements of height, leaf area index, et cetera. They do destructive sampling and take the uh, the plants into the lab, do additional measurements, grind them up, send them off, determine what the chemical composition is. This is very time consuming. So if remote sensing uh, can be utilized in combination with um Uh, machine learning methods, then that would save a lot of time and and cost. Further, you can only cover a a small amount of ground, uh, you know, unless you have an army of people. Um, And uh, and so this would be, uh, if we can use remote sensing, then we can extend it in a, a spatial sense. So thinking about this in the field, there's uh, challenges, you know, it sounds like a good idea. But uh, what we have is this, you know, natural environment. It's uncontrolled. Um, depending on where you, um, the crop you're, you're planting and the location you're at, you may get one crop a year uh, at best, maybe two or three. Um, and so you have this environment where your replications of the experiment are going to be hard to um, control. And furthermore, each one of them will be different because of the weather. Um, If you have extensive remote sensing data sets, which are going to be high resolution in this case, then you're going to need to um, have to uh, make sure that they're very well aligned and a lot of processing is going to be required. Now, we have a lot of samples, all right, but we have limited reference data, and that's the field measurements that I showed you before, or it could come from image annotation after the fact. But there are also lots of opportunities because, you know, we address problems. And so this gives us opportunities for um, developing new methodologies. And so some of the most promising ones are um, opportunities to develop um, capability to mitigate this labeled uh, data that's uh, limited in in quantity, uh, potentially uh, during using transfer learning and exploit the spatial and spectral patterns in the sensors that uh, is not able to be done uh, very uh, effectively in the field, even if you have a field spectrometer with a leaf clamp and you get a spectral signature, all right? It's a very limited area. 
So this is a layout here of an experiment. Um, this is a calibration panel where lots of measurements are made. Uh, destructive sampling has occurred here. Uh, this is another panel. And these are uh, panels that are used that have more varieties in them than the original calibration, but similar. And so this is, in a sense, going to be your test set in many cases, but it's um, located uh, typically very close by. Now, the technologies that are used um, in these environments um, are, you know, pretty standard. So RGB cameras are used and they're when you need high spatial resolution, then, you know, we know that RGB is the way to go as long as you don't need spectral um, information. LIDAR is now very common on these platforms. Now, I show you UAVs, but um, this could also be on a manned aircraft. Um, Wiener and SWIR, hyperspectral data. And then, of course, you need to have good geolocation. I show here also reference targets that are calibrated that are used um, for converting uh, radiances to reflectance. All right, so I mentioned the spatial information in terms of georeferencing is very important. The best way to do that, if you possibly can, is to call up your friends in geomatics. And um, essentially what I show here is you have the GNSS, INS, uh, which is the only part of this system that knows where it is and where it's looking. And then speaking sort of in a, a rough way, then you would survey in the rest of the sensors, the LIDAR and the camera sensors relative to the GNSS. SINS uh, system, and then you would map that body frame to whatever you're interested in. Now, if you do this effectively, then what you have is, um, let's get this animation here. Sometimes these don't go so fast. Hmm. All right. There we go. Um, so let's just show this uh, small area and blow it up. And you will see there are row segments here. So one of the things you have to do, because these plots are in two, four, eight, whatever numbers of rows, then you need to delineate those so that you can pull out the data associated with a given variety. And so this is an example of a 12 row plot. And um, you can that uh, you see the first four rows, the second four, and the third four um, that are utilized and um, most of these rows in this case are used for destructive sampling during the season and then uh, rows two and three are not touched and so they're utilized in um, as the continuous measurements that you would use later in the season. And then if you have a really good data set that's co-aligned properly, then you can uh, utilize it throughout the season and uh, you don't have to do image to image registration, which is never going to be as good as doing a proper system calibration that will be good for any location, any altitude, et cetera. All right, so let's now talk about some applications. So the first one is object detection and counting. Um, now, there's multiple strategies that are used. The uh, first and most uh, simple is regression-based approaches. And so what you would do would be have ground-based reference data, um, and you would measure, uh, you know, the, whatever the counts are, and you would then utilize your remote sensing data and develop a regression model. Now, that's good, but it doesn't give you any information relative to the location. And people are very interested in both the um, the counts and the location because you might have within a given row uh, skips or you might have done some destructive sampling and you need to skip that or, you know, many reasons. So um, this is not as as um, as popular now as detection based approaches, which I show down here. Um, density approaches are also used and I'll show an example of that uh, as well. And then the challenges of these are, you know, relative to object detection is getting uh, adequate uh, relevant annotated data. Now, this shows you some standard data sets. This is, uh, I believe, from ImageNet. And um, this uh, is from the VizDrone data set, neither of which looks like plants down here. But the other thing is, you know, the resolution of the data can differ in terms of uh, what your application is from what the original data set that might have been used to train the network that you, by the way, might want to use and then update. 
So the ex reason that we're interested in this is for uh, plant counting early season, but then later in the season during flowering, you're interested in doing tassel detection or panicles if it's sorghum. And this is a hard problem because you have occlusions, uh, very dense objects, um, as well as they're dense, but they're sparse. They're sparse relative to the occupy a small amount of the area of the image, but they're dense in terms of being uh, close to each other. Uh, you might also use this for um, detecting disease in the early stages. So these are some examples. Uh, and again, this is a little bit of a historical approach. Uh, I'm showing you here, RetinaNet was used um, extensively in the early days. And um, one of the things for these um, approaches you need to understand is they have typically uh, a requirement relative to the kind of annotated data that is provided. And so this is an anchor-based annotation um, where you would actually determine what the, um, the box would be, and then uh, they will regress then to the target bounding box. This is time-consuming to collect this training data, um, and we'll see some results where, um, you know, some improvements were made over time. Now, CinderNet uses key point estimation. So it's going to be a center point, and then it will regress to all the other object properties. And um, this is good for modeling single plants that have centers where you don't really need to have the, um, the leaves modeled, um, the tassel modeled, et cetera. And so this gives it uh, an advantage in terms of being quick for annotation. Um, and this can be used in, a, in multiple ways. Uh, I'm going to show an example, which is simplified for this one class detection problem where we have one thing we're trying to detect. And then the YOLO um, um, strategies have also been used, moving all the way back to um, uh, YOLO v3 and um, YOLO v4, YOLO f, YOLO v5 is the latest on the block. We need to be careful. You know, just because something is new at CDPR doesn't mean that we need to incorporate it into our application. We need to look at what the problems are that each of these methodologies are trying to solve. And if it's common to ours, then we need to consider it. But otherwise, you know, we might get a publication, but we're not going to help the, um, the world in terms of solving problems. And so <clears throat> now let's look at um, this uh, CenterNet, which is an example that I mentioned earlier in which we use operationally. So it uses this uh, simple stacked hourglass and what you have is the input of the plants and then the output shown here with these dots are detected uh, locations just as examples. Or you might, you would have two colors, potentially one that would be showing the reference data and the other would be showing uh, what you detected. And you want to, you want to know where it is, you want to locate it, and then you can count easily after the fact. So showing some results of this, um, then what we have here, and this also includes uh, a very simple Im um, implementation of transfer learning. So this is at one location referred to as, as Acre. This is uh, at a second location referred to as Wabash. Now you can see they, these are RGB images. They look quite different. Um, in this case, there is uh, a, quite a bit of residue and you can also see that the soils are different. So I just want to show you some results. So this, you can see, is a very small amount of data. So you train on 600 of these images. And then I'm going to show you this result is blind prediction on Wabash. Then down below, now you, what we'll see, let's look at the ground truth. It's red. Well, you see it's you know pretty much overlaid with the yellow, which is going to be the true positives. The false positives are blue and the false negatives are cyan. But you see down here visually, it gets much better when you use few shot learning. And so looking at this uh, in terms of the metrics, the accuracy of RetinaNet with blind application is only about 10%. CinderNet with blind application was about 86%, and they have the standard deviations here as well. And if we look then at just a little bit of few shot learning where we had 150 images from Wabash, which so saved us quite a bit of time, then we went up from 86 to about 91%. So that's, you know, a, a significant improvement. And we also have, uh, you know, improvement in terms of just looking at these other metrics. Now, some friends of ours at IBM were also 
uh, working on this. And so they were using the counting and it wasn't of plants, but of panicles, which are, um, they're similar to tassels for those that you that you know, know maize, but you don't know sorghum. Sorghum has this um, seed panicle that's on the top of the plant. And so they were counting that because this was a biofuels experiment. And so um, they used this, you know, straightforward convolutional neural network. They used RGB data, but they also included something that makes this, I think, um, important. They included uh, something that had to do with um, the days since planting. And in addition, it also had a, a temperature measurement. Um, and so this is all incorporated into this uh, statistic. And so their output was a density map. And so that was one of the approaches I mentioned before. Now for annotation, they did do some augmentation here and you can see why that might be appropriate here. Now, one of the problems you run into if you're doing multi-temporal analysis and you're doing it in, a, you know, analyze each data set independently, then there's um, things that can happen. You know, in this case, you have very complex scenes and you might have panicles that are occluded. Um, you might have, um, you know, different atmospheric conditions. Uh, but in any event, you're not guaranteed by this approach to have the panicles. You know, they don't go away. All they do is you end up having a, a panicle. It grows and that's uh, part of the flowering process. Uh, additional panicles throughout this flowering season um, are um, emerge. And so they should not, um, you know, as you go through time, they should only increase or stay the same. And so flowering is done when it stays the same. So one of the ways that you can um, deal with this, and this is what they did, was use monotonic time series um, as inputs, and then they used on an isotonic regression. And so you can see the, the improvement. Whereas here, you have some of the panicles going down, which they knew was not the case uh, over time. And then here you actually had um, a more reasonable result. Now, this has moved on. And um, Wei Lu, who is uh, uh, going to be part of the part three, has just published a paper. And so he's working on YOLO V5. And, uh, you know, that has to requires more complex annotation. Um, and just to give you, you know, a feel for where um, this field can go with more complex problems, then um, these were the um, extensions that he um, implemented in Yellow V5. Now, going back to one of the more important things, annotation, that box annotation is a real pain. So we do a quick run through the first time with CenterNet and you see most of them. It doesn't do as good uh, in terms of the result as having boxes with anchors, but it gives you a guideline. And so that's very helpful. Another thing that we found is um, that if we use um, a, an original data set to, um, with, you know, a network uh, to train our network, then um, you're not going to do as well if it's totally different from the data set that, uh, uh, you're actually uh, analyzing. And so um, we did the transfer learning based on this drone data uh, as the original. Okay, and then we have our data. Um, this is a case where you have, it's very difficult to get a lot of labeled data. And so this would be a strategy you would wanna use. And so just looking at some um, of the standard methods, then what you can see in terms of the metrics is that the proposed method that he developed is doing, doing better. And then the question is, um, in terms of computation, you need to compare them. Um, and you also need to, to work with people in the field to evaluate. So moving on then um, from the counting, then there are other kinds of, of uh, variables that might want to be predicted or um, detected. Um, and so some of these in agriculture might be the grain yield, biomass, leaf area index, both in agriculture and forestry. Now, one of the things that's really difficult is that you have these complex relationships that are between these measurements and the remote sensing data, and they're usually nonlinear. And so what you're trying to do is to determine what some effective features might be, and this might be iterative, um, that are going to match to the, the traits of interest that are going to be, from a knowledge point of view, important in the prediction. Again, we're um, dealing with limited number of reference samples as usual. And then there's even within um, 
uh, variety variability, which you know, not it's it's not a constant thing. The um, the genetics and the the biological uh, response is variable. So this is complex, but there there's hope. So the first example I'm going to show you is related to prediction at the end of the year. So it's one year and um, predicting the uh, results at the end of the year. So this is a nitrogen experiment. And so this is a plant that's stressed in terms of nitrogen. And this just shows you the nitrogen cycle. And so what people try to do is trade off in terms of the, um, the nitrogen application rate, then the response, because as you increase the nitrogen rate of application, we know that, you know, over a certain part of the curve, you're going, your yield will improve. Whereas as you can see here, it has not improved. So you have both the economic and the environmental impacts that are trading off. So this experiment um, was a management practice, i.e. they're trying to determine uh, the different nitrogen rates uh, response. And so this is laying out the experiment where you would have each of the rates uh, indicated here. And there are replicates in this experiment, as you can see by the colors. So in terms of the remote sensing data, um, I showed you the sensors, but the kind of data that come from them, there's the genetics um, markers. Now, there's about 80,000 of these. So this is, if there's ever a high dimensional problem, then uh, this is it. And the kind of approaches that have typically been um, utilized uh, in an effective way are principal components and wavelets. And both of them have, uh, I would say with wavelets giving a bit of an edge, but uh, principal components being more widely used to provide inputs. You'd have RGB features. So the kind of things you can get from RGB features are the counts, as I mentioned. You could get some estimate of the canopy cover. It's a, you know, an aerial kind of thing. Um, and you might, if you're uh, very high resolution, get leaf counts. So hyperspectral data, as we know, is going to give reflectance values in up to hundreds of bands. Uh, now, from that, you could extract vegetation indices. I'm sure you're all familiar with the infamous NDVI. You can also look at the curve. And because essentially what you're doing is, is uh, leveraging absorption features. And that's really shown in terms of the derivatives on the curve. Uh, that might be aligned with various chemistry response, chemical related responses and integration features where you're integrating over some area of the curve um, and uh, over some number of wavelengths. LIDAR features. Now you can, of course, easily get the heights and you might be interested because of penetration in the height percentiles, um, you know, in terms of the response at various um, heights, the volume rather than just the area. A canopy cover could be obtained just as it is up here. Um, and then the height statistics, as I mentioned. So this just is a graphic showing those various uh, remote sensing inputs. There's also weather. And so let's look over here at the right first, the weather data um, and the kind of weather. Well, all right. Precipitation is important, and this shows the cumulative precipitation throughout the year. Um, you would also potentially be interested in uh, the growing degree days. And I mentioned this earlier in that experiment with the panicle counting, uh, but didn't allude, didn't describe it in detail. So it has to do with the temperature since the beginning of the, uh, the season. And um, this would be where you plant it, and this is the accumulation of it throughout the year. Um, and then radiation, okay, because we know that it's different uh, if it's cloudy than if it's not. This is an example of the LIDAR. And again, the row segments, which have been extracted um, from the RGB data or actually from all of the data, because all of these data sets will be utilized to describe the response within this uh, row segment. The kind of model that's used is a uh, version of, a, of an RNN. It's a prediction model. And uh, for those that you may not have, you know, used LSTM models, they're just a form of RNN. And um, I think we there. Um, but it has memory cells within it and they store the information and they're updated, um, you know, by what's called gates and they're forget input and output gates. And the number of memory cells you have and the depth of the network, the number of um, these stages um, is going to be dependent on your problem. In our case, it's a true time series problem. And so these are set up to be at times when it's important physiologically in the growing season. 
Now, with all of these inputs, then you really need to do something in terms of feature selection. And one of the things that's uh, been uh, looked at uh, recently um, in the context of deep learning, uh, and particularly for LSTM, is how you might effectively select the features in this um, in, in some way that's not just a straightforward um, you know, elimination sort of uh, approach, which might be standard or, or evaluating the importance of features and eliminating because you need to think about them over time. And so um, this um, uh, Shapley approach, uh, which is, you know, referred to as, as SHAP, and there are various versions of it. One is uh, Deep SHAP for, uh, for uh, uh, neural networks. Then what we do, you run your day, your model, and then what you do after you run the first round of model, the first model, then you do the feature importance using the SHAP strategy. You select it, and then you might run it again. You you know you might iterate on this a bit because you always have to look at your results, and then you run your model again and you incorporate all the um, information you need. Okay, now just to show you and just to make sure you believe me, um, this. Um, had 50 hyperspectral indices initially that were um, referenced in these studies that have, some of them lab. Now, what you see is this animation on the right, and I'll just, it'll run, so I'll get to it in a minute. Um, 12 features that are gonna be um, based on, from the hyperspectral um, data, based on the derivatives and the integrations um, over these ranges. Uh, and then looking below, then there were uh, these, um, examples where you see the hyperspectral image, just an NDVI to show you what it's um, pretty coarse because it's small, um, what the, where the plants are. And then this is the mask image showing you the, the results. And this is mask image is what goes into the analysis. So this is just for the hyperspectral data. Now, if you look over on the right, what you see in the lower right-hand corner are the dates. So this is up to 815. Let's go back. The features, all of those features are listed here. 617, now watch it move, 703, 720, 727, 815. So the features in terms of their individual importance changes over time. So it's important to take that into account. And so using this, fact, uh, this particular feature selection approach, then these are the uh, results that we obtain. And in terms of the model, then um, these are this is the, the resulting model. There's a little bit of problem here on the high end with regard to the reference compared to the prediction. Um, and this includes the effect of management practices and the weather. And um, this only had um, uh, one, we didn't have to worry about genetics because you only had one um, uh, variety here. So these are all the different rates. Um, and if you did something in terms of attention networks where you brought in the um, the importance associated with the different stages rather than emphasizing so much the last stage, then you actually can improve this. All right, so that was one example in, in prediction. Um, this is another in transfer learning, and this is transfer learning over time. Okay, so um, what we have here is the biomass. In this case, it's sorghum, and I mentioned sorghum. This is sorghum here, if you don't know what it is. Um, it's a it's very important for biofuels, but it's also a food crop in uh, some parts of the world, and it's very drought resistant. You can hardly get rid of it. All right, so... Um, the biomass is measured through this predictive, here you go, you see this destructive sampling. And so um, when you have a model and you develop it for a year, you have a model that, and I'll show you, is really good for that year, but what good is it for you? Because you are, it, um, you, the year's done, okay? So what can I do in terms of using this model on a subsequent year? Um, and another question that I'm not going to address here is what can I do in terms of also um, predicting from the mid-season? So the question is, can I get accurate multi-year uh, predictions? And they might have different genetics. They might have different environments and different management practices. And so this is the date. These are the data sets that were used. Um, and the, the data sets between 18 and, and 21 are more similar. So looking here at a subset of those, then you see um, 2018. Now there's always a calibration panel, which would be over here, where all this sampling is done and the measurements are made. We fly the whole thing. 
And then what you want to do is also do the predictions um, based on the, um, the full data set. And so um, looking at the results biomass at the end of the year, you can see it's variable. And so you would want it to be reflected. The uh, sowing dates are different depending on the weather. Sometimes it's wet and cold. And that gives you, uh, you know, a different kind of response of the plants when they're uh, planted late. Uh, you might have more rain, less rain, et cetera. And so this variation is shown here. And again, this is very similar to what I showed before. Um, we are also using an LSTM um, network. Um, we don't have the management practices because uh, we're not doing irrigation or different nitrogen applications. So it's all one, it's the, the genetics that's important. And so just to show you some results, um, uh, just keep in mind, first the model. Okay, what we have is this model that is going to be um, trained with 726 samples. Model two, is gonna be trained with samples um, um, that are going to be from 2018. So here, uh, this is, uh, you'll see it a little bit better. So we, you have the very best thing you can when you train and test on a given year. We, I'll show you results for each of those. Then what we'll do is we're going to look at examples where we train on one year and apply it blindly or train on one year and apply it with transfer learning. And the two types of transfer learning we're going to look at are here, where we refine it with randomly selected samples or with those that are smartly selected, trying to do it from clusters that are homogeneous. All right, I also wanna point out here that this R squared value that's reported down here, because you might get a little nervous when you see this negative value, is going to be the comparison to the one-to-one -one line, okay, the ground uh, reference. So. Individual biomass prediction is really pretty good for train and test on 2017, 18, 19, and 20. But when we try to train on 2018 and then test on 2019, we don't do so well. And similarly, 18 and test on 20. All right, so it's even worse. So this is these are the experiments that I mentioned, one through four. So this is the, the uh, pre-trained year, okay? So 2018. A1, and then at this experiment, uh, we're using um, A1, you have 50 uh, um, additional points that are gonna be um, from the, the, the smart selection and 50 uh, that are going to be from the randomly selected. So this is 2019, it's trained on that, and you don't select anything because you're gonna be doing the comparison here. Similarly, you're gonna be doing the comparison here, and then this is 2018 and with regard to, um, you know, no fine tuning. So testing on 2019, the bold one here is the winner. So A2 is trained from scratch, as I said, okay, from the 2019. And then what we're going to do is we're going to be testing, okay, this is experiment A1, which was trained on um, 18 and then updated with the 19 uh, data. And so you end up with, uh, you know, a particular value of R squared. Look at A3, all right, you don't do so well when you actually select them randomly, which is not surprising because you don't have good coverage. Um, this would be where you actually had the, two, the best you could do because you trained on it and you had all the data from 2019. And then this is the blind application, okay? Train on 2018, blindly apply to 2019. And this is doing the same thing for 2020. So A1 again does the best. And um, in com now, you might say this is a low R squared. Well, keep in mind that if all you're looking for is linearity, which is the, um, you know, the measure we often use for R squared, then it's much better than that. But in terms of what's useful, then comparing it to the one-to-one -one is really the important thing. And you can see that um, this one in terms of uh, blind application is not so great. Okay. Now, um, this is just one more example. And so in the interest of time, then what I'll do is I'll just move on. So looking forward, um, you know, there's a lot more to do. Um, we, 
you know, have some strategies that all of us are looking at for um, this limited reference sample issue. And Dr. Prasad mentioned that um, incorporating GANs is something that looks promising for some applications. I mentioned as well that trying to incorporate active learning, and you might also uh, use Bayesian networks, which would be, um, in, you know, incorporating your prior. Um, the work on annotation uh, in terms of software to do annotation capability to augment, uh, you know, what you have um, with some sort of knowledge as we did with running it with one simple algorithm and using that to guide the eye um, is helpful, but, you know, uh, new, new approaches are, are always welcome. And um, so one of the things that I uh, indicated here was the uh, use of features versus uh, for selection versus uh, extraction. And a number of people are very strong proponents of let the data talk for itself. Um, and either, you know, in terms of encoding, um, you know, using various forms of feature extraction, um, there's still a lot more to be done, um, particularly in common in terms of trying to develop explainable um, networks. And the whole field of domain adaptation and transfer learning, I think, is really uh, there are a lot of strategies, but it's really at its beginning. There are a lot many, uh, a lot more other strategies that could be used. And finally, you know, this is over a small area. You saw these are, are uh, UAVs. You can only be in the air with these platforms for 20 or 30 minutes. Well, you say, all right, maybe I could go with a fixed wing. All right, get it up to 40 minutes. But what you really need to do is you need to acquire data over larger areas. And that needs to be either with manned aircraft or satellites. And so what we need to do is to take what we are learning here in very high resolution and embed that, be able to do integration um, of this information and potentially super resolution kind of approaches to uh, improve and extend uh, what we're getting from our coarser resolution data. Now, ultimately, what you want to do is you want to integrate what you have, not just from the field across space, but you also want to integrate it uh, from the uh, original development uh, in control facilities to the field-based models, all the way to UAVs and then aircraft and, and, uh, res um, and man um, manned aircraft and satellites. So this is where a lot of work needs to be done. And then, uh, you know, finally, we need to think about, you know, we don't have any of the physiology in this. We're just observing. So there are crop models. There are mechanistic models. They're called or process models that actually have a lot of the physiology incorporated. And so that biophysics needs to be incorporated. Now, you run a simulation model like that, and you get one point. Well, how can we effectively utilize that in conjunction with the remote sensing data that we're observing and improve uh, still further? So this is all I have, and I want to say thank you so much for your attention. Um, I have. So, um, so this, um, the accuracy for object detection, yes. So we have all of these, these uh, uh, I agree with you, we report all of these um, metrics, and um, uh, and this was just an example to, um, with regard to CenterNet. And uh, so I agree with you in that respect. Any other questions? This was from Jose. Thank you for your, your comment. If you were to look at the, um, the papers that are referenced, they all include more metrics. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. I think we might uh, have a small break, I'm not sure. Um, before the setup for the hands-on exercise. Um, Dr. Prasad, what is? Um, yes, uh, Dalton, what do you suggest? Should we take a few minutes? Um, yeah, I think a five, five minute, five to 10 minutes. Is sure. perfect, leg stretching, and grabbing we'll coffee. Be back and and if for, for the audience who's back, uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing our stuff on Google Colab. So whenever you're back, if you just want to pull that up, up go to um, the Google Colab and open up, uh, and just just sign in or create an account. We can we can guide you through that if needed later as well.
So Rob, I think we can start whenever you hear it's okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dalton. So what uh, what we plan to do next is uh, let me introduce um, Anand Yagmore at the University of Houston, and uh, so we've got Anand uh, and and Wei Liu at Purdue University, and so they're PhD students working with uh, myself and Professor Crawford. Uh, respectively, and so uh, they will help us uh, step through uh, some hands-on exercises that they've cre that, that have been created on Google Colab. So, um, if you don't mind, uh, the audience, if you can uh, go to colab.research.google.com, and uh, we can step through um, the example code with you. And we'll so what we'll do is, in fact, I'll I'll give the floor to Anand, but basically we'll have some code that we'll share with you and then we'll step through portions of the code with you and we can even ask you to sort of uh, maybe code a piece of a network um, and, and, and step through it with us. So w without further ado, Anand, Anand, the floor is yours. Hi, I am uh, Anand Yagmur and um, in this uh, hands-on exercise, um, we will try to apply 2D convolutional neural network and 3D convolutional neural network on um, hyperspectral uh, images. But uh, before we go through um, these two exercises, uh, I would like to indicate that all uh, the codes presented in this exercise can be downloaded from this repo on GitHub. And also uh, all uh, the data sets uh, used in this uh, exercises can be downloaded uh, from this uh, website, which, which is uh, 2013 IEEE GRSS Data Fusion uh, Contest. Okay, so let's start with an uh, introduction. <clears throat> so in this introduction, we will try to uh, give a brief picture uh, about uh, what is a hyperspectral images. Uh, hyperspectral images is nothing but a mathematical function that uh, maps um, locations in space to um, a vector contains um, intensity of um, dense uh, uh, optical bands. So to make uh, things clear, uh, if we compare hyperspectral um, images to grayscale images, for example, in a grayscale image images, we uh, map each location in space to a one single value intensity level, we call it a gray level or yeah, uh, gray, uh, gray scale, the gray scale uh, intensity. That's why we call it gray scale uh, image. If we compare, if we compare it to also a very uh, common or a very uh, known um, type of images, which are RGB images, uh, and those images, we map each location in space to a three valued vector that has the intensity of the red, green, blue uh, uh, colors. However, in hyperspectral images, we uh, map each location to more than just three bands. More than uh, RGB, we, um, we uh, map it to any uh, uh, number of bands uh, we would like to, uh, to have. So in our case here, we are mapping each location uh, in space to a vector of uh, length 144 Bands. So this is simply a uh, hyperspectral uh, um, images as um, as mathematical uh, functions. Uh, um, the second uh, important idea we would I'd like to cover in this introduction is that our main goal uh, in this exercise is to implement a model GeoFix that we provide to it um, a cube like this. And this uh, function or this model should be able to classify each pixel into um, uh, uh, to uh, one of the uh, 15 classes we have here. So this is simply our goal that we are trying. This is our ultimate goal or our uh, main goal that we are trying to achieve here in these two uh, exercises. However, um, because um, as we can see here, we have uh, this this um, cube. The original cube uh, is um, needs a lot of computational power to be used during training and calculation uh, 
using this model. So uh, that's why we decided to reduce the number of bands from uh, 144 to 16 using a typical um, dimension reduction technique, which is a uh, principal component uh, analysis. So uh, during this exercise, the actual uh, cube that we will use will be of this dimension and as we can see here it has the same width as the original cube here the same width uh, um, sorry the same height the same width uh, but instead of using the 144 the uh, old channels uh, we have in the original cube we will use the um, reduced version using pca uh, method which uh, which results in uh, which results in 16 uh, bands instead of 144 uh, so this all about the um, introduction about hypospectral images in general and uh, the data set that we will use or the cube, the hypospectral image we will use during this uh, these two exercises. Now talking about the training and uh, testing um, data sets uh, preparation. One way to let uh, one way to let our model GeoFix to be able to do uh, within scene classification is by feeding it with a small window around each pixel called patch. Then uh, GeoFix uh, should be should predict the class of that patch and assign uh, the predicted label to the central pixel. So uh, we can consider this uh, big cube as a collection or as, as a set of smaller cubes called patches so uh, what we what uh, we would like to do is to unpack this big cube into smaller patches and then uh, feed each small cube to our model geofix and our model geofix will produce a label to the central pixel of that patch and by looping and uh, by uh, looping through all the pixels in the scene, uh, we will produce what is called the inference map, which is nothing but a class per pixel matrix, which should have uh, the same um, spatial dimension as our original uh, cube. Uh, based on that, we are trying to achieve uh, as an end goal, based on what we are trying to uh, achieve as, a, as an end goal, which is generating the inference map, which is nothing but... Um, class per pixel map we need to prepare the training and testing that assist in the form of patches and their uh, associated class names for the first part uh, of this session we will let patches to have uh, a fixed size of 5 by 5 by uh, 16 however in the second part um, we will try to experiment with different spatial dimensions of these uh, patches to see how they will affect the learning uh, process now, uh, looking at the following table, the following uh, table shows the class uh, uh, label in the first column and the number of label patches per pixels in the second uh, column. And um, one important or one very important um, information uh, one should extract um, from this table is that, as we can see here, the overall label uh, pixels or patches we have is much, much smaller than the total number of patches or the, no, or, or the total number of pixels we have in our original scene. So the number of pixels, the total number of pixels we have is the multiplication of the two spatial dimensions, which is which are uh, 349 multiplied by 100, uh, sorry, 1,905. However, we are not, uh, we are just using a subset uh, uh, of those total number of, of pixels and uh, we call uh, those as a label pixels and the rest of the pixels are unlabeled uh, pixels. From above table, it should be clear that the overall patches we have as a ground truth are a subset of the overall uh, pixels. For each class, we would like to randomly divide its patches into three different data sets, training, validation, and testing data sets. The training data set will be used to train the model and update, and update its weights, whereas the validation data set will be used to assess the performance of the model during the training process. It should be very clear that the validation samples will not be seen by the model during the training phase. What I mean by that is that we will not use those uh, samples from the validation data, data set to update the model weights during, or the model parameters during the training phase. And for the testing data set, it will be used to evaluate the model performance after the training process. 
Uh, so we concatenate training patches across classes to formulate all train patch and all train labels address. And uh, when you see any uh, words or um, names in italic, uh, this means that you will find we will use the exact same name uh, in the code, inside the code. So uh, and if you look at the code, you will see that we have uh, these two arrays that the in, in which the first one is containing all patches across all classes for the training. And the second uh, array, uh, it will contain all the labels uh, for the training uh, data set. Uh, we also do the same for validation and testing a data set. Uh, the function uh, train testing data set generator will do this for us. So this will be done for us uh, automatically. So we don't need we don't need to care about that. So um, this function, which is um, training testing data set generator, uh, has two arguments: the patch size and the number of training patches per class. And it's supposed to retain the three data sets. Uh, training, validation, and testing. And when I say right now a data set, I mean the patches and uh, its corresponding uh, labels. So this is uh, how we define our data set uh, inside the code. And this is all about the uh, preparing the data sets for testing, validation, and uh, training phases. Now, uh, talking about uh, model implementation uh, and training. Regarding the model architecture, in the first part, we would like our 2D model, GeoFix, to have uh, the architecture shown in the table uh, below, where the first column shows the required layers, and the second column shows the output shape of each layer and the third column shows the number of parameters in each layer. So as we see here, um, this is the uh, model architecture we would like to implement in this exercise. And as we can see here, we have the 2D convolutional uh, layers. And uh, we see here the uh, output shape uh, of each layer. So the dimensions um, provided here are defined as follows. The first dimension represents the batch size. The second dimension represents the number of bands. And the rest represents the uh, spatial uh, dimensions. So this is the height, and this is uh, the width. And uh, in all the convolutional layers in our model, where we require that the kernel size to be of size 3 uh, by 3. Uh, moreover, we can see that um, we can see that uh, all the convolutional uh, layers preserve the dimensional uh, preserve the spatial uh, dimensions, and this implies that we should use some sort of padding when define those uh, layers to make sure that the convolution uh, process will preserve will preserve the uh, spatial. Uh, dimensions. So, uh, as we said previously, that in the first uh, scenario or in the first um, part, we will uh, let the patches to be of size five by five. And we see here, for example, the output of this first layer also has the size five by five. This means we have used um, uh, padding of uh, padding of one, since the kernel size is uh, uh, three by three. And by doing this, we preserved uh, we preserved the spatial dimension. Uh, after the convolution uh, process. And we require that all the convolution layer to have the kernel size. So the bottom line is that all the convolution layer in our model should have uh, the kernel uh, of size 3 by 3. And also all of them should use uh, padding of 1. Uh, regarding the max pooling uh, layers, we require them to have um, a kernel size of 2 by 2. and um, there is no padding, there is no padding, or uh, there is no stride uh, used uh, at all. So this is about the uh, uh, model uh, architecture we would like to have or to implement during this uh, exercise. However, in the second part, we will try to see the effect of varying the number of convolutional layers uh, on the learning uh, process. Uh, now, speaking about the package or the library we will use to implement this model. Uh, we will use PyTorch library. Um, 
as our framework for model implementation and uh, validation. PyTorch requires the model to be represented as a derived uh, or subclass that has a constructor, or you can call it object initializer, and a forward uh, function. So simply, you need to satisfy three conditions in implementing the class representing your model. First, it should be a subclass from a specific class that, as we will see uh, shortly. Second, it should has it should have, sorry, um, object initializer instructor, and also it should have a function called uh, forward. And uh, the name forward is preserved. So you should call this function forward, and you shouldn't use any other name for that uh, function. And this function uh, simply will be used when you uh, call uh, your model after implementing. Uh, should be This function will be called uh, every time you call your uh, function to do any uh, evaluation. Okay. Uh, the main paradigm to implement a model in PyTorch is to create uh, models, different layer, layers in the constructor as object attributes, and then connect them, I mean the layer, in the forward uh, function. For a simple example of implementing uh, a model on PyTorch, one could refer to this piece. Let me open it very quickly. And then here we have um, a good... Um, tutorial about how to implement a simple uh, model uh, using uh, PyTorch. Uh, also, we intentionally forgot to implement the model class to let you do it yourself and um, enjoy the learning process. Uh, now, talking, so this is regarding the model implementation. It should be implemented as a subclass, and we should provide these two functions, uh, the constructor, uh, the initializer, and the forward function. Now, uh, speaking about the uh, model training, after implementing our model as a class, we need to train it using the training data set we previously prepared. Function train will do this for us, and its role can be summarized as follows. It will be divide the training data set into smaller subsets we call batches. So please um, differentiate between patch and batch. Patch is a smaller cube around each pixel in, the, in our original cube, and batch is just a collection as a, a portion, as a subset of the training data set. Or, yeah. Then each batch will be fed to the model to compute class predictions for the uh, batch samples. These predictions will, will uh, then be used to calculate the loss function. In this implementation, we used cross entropy uh, uh, loss function as our uh, loss function, and um, the exact definition can be found here. Also, uh, from PyTorch documentation, uh, here is the uh, mathematical um, definition uh, if one is interested uh, to know uh, what's going on exactly. We call uh, this flow, which starts at the model input and ends at the loss function output forward propagation. We use the loss function output computed at the final stage of the forward propagation and feed it back to the model to compute the gradients and update the model uh, weights. I mean parameters here, uh, in general, the weights and the offsets. Uh, this uh, this uh, reverse flow starts um, also. Um, this uh, reverse uh, flow uh, starts at the loss function output and ends at, um, at model input. We call it tag uh, back propagation. I mean that after calculating the loss function, when we use uh, this loss function to compute the gradients across all parts of the models, we call uh, of the model we call this uh, uh, backward propagation. So during the training phase, each batch should go through forward and uh, backward uh, uh, propagations. Looping through all batches for one time is the definition of an epoch. The number of epochs needed to train a model is a hyperparameter defined by the user. This means by us. So for each, uh, for each epoch, we can define uh, the training loss as the mean of the batch loss across all batches. So as I mentioned previously, each time we, we, we pass a batch, we, we have one value of the loss function. So um, uh, the, the, the loss during one epoch is simply the average uh, of the uh, loss function values across all batches used. So if I have, for example, three batches, 
I divided my training data set into three batches. Then I, uh, after finishing one epoch, I will have three values of the loss function. Then if I take the mean of those three values, I will end up with the epoch, epoch loss, we can, we can call it. For the validation process, we divide the validation data set into batches as we did for the training data set. However, each validation batch needs only to go through the forward propagation to calculate its loss. Why is that? As I mentioned previously, that because the validation data set is simply just to evaluate the model performance during the training phase and its samples shouldn't be used to, uh, to uh, train, i.e. update the model uh, parameter, parameters. So we don't need to calculate any gradients. So we don't, uh, that's why we don't, uh, we, we don't need to uh, have a back propagation for the validation data set uh, batch. The validation loss can be defined similarly as a training uh, loss by um, taking the mean of validation uh, uh, batches losses. Now talking about uh, model evaluation, uh, we will use the performance uh, evaluation metrics to um, assess uh, the model performance. Those uh, metrics are uh, inference map and confusion matrix and total accuracy. So let's start with the inference map generation. As defined previously, the inference map contains the class predictions for each pixel. It serves as a visual evaluation of model performance, which is of great importance when the number of ground truth labeled patches is less than the number of overall pixels, as in our case. Further, in uh, geospatial imaging applications, such um, an inference map is often the desired product of the semantic segmentation uh, classification for downstream analysis by uh, domain express. So simply in this step, we will try to generate, uh, to classify each pixel in our, um, in the scene. And then uh, we will um, evaluate by eye to see how the model is uh, performing. Because as we said previously, we don't have the labels for each pixels in order to compare, to, 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 to use only um, the labels or to look at the labels. So we need to generate the inference map for the other pixels, which are the unlabeled uh, pixels, to see how the model is uh, performing. So this is uh, one of the uh, very important um, uh, benefits that's provided by uh, inference, uh, inference map. Uh, the function uh, inference will generate uh, the inference map for us and um, color code color coded it uh, using the uh, color map uh, shown in figure one, which is we so simply speaking, uh, we will use uh, this uh, color map to uh, for each uh, class and um, to see how the model is um, performing. Uh, this function, which is the function inference, uh, takes two inputs as its argument, the patch size and the cube, the hyperspectral image cube uh, we have. Now talking about the confusion matrix, the confusion matrix is a, a set of uh, CIJs, which is a square matrix where one dimension represents the true classes and the other represents the predicted classes. So let the first dimension I represents the true classes and the second dimension J represents the predicted classes. Then CIJ can be defined or C uh, sub IJ can be defined as the conditional probability, which is nothing but the probability of uh, our model uh, assigning a class J to the input belongs to class I. Simply, this is the condition of probability, or this is the definition of C, I, J. What is the probability that our model will give a class J for given that the input belongs to class I? Based on this definition, we can see that the sensitivity of each class resides on the main diagonal of the confusion, of the confusion, of the confusion matrix. Function uh, confusion math takes our trained model and um, testing data set, patches and labels again, defined previously as its uh, arguments to generate uh, the confusion matrix. Finally, talking about the total accuracy, which is very well known, a very simple 
evaluation metric, which is uh, the total accuracy is defined as uh, the total number of correctly classified patches divided by the total number of test patches, which is also produced by the confusion uh, uh, math function. So the confusion math uh, function is responsible for generating two metrics, the confusion matrix and the total um, accuracy. So uh, let's stop uh, talking about the theoretical part here. And uh, let's uh, go to uh, to the code to see how we can um, run uh, the first part of this uh, exercise. Uh, the first in the first cell here, uh, we only importing the required uh, packages and libraries uh, for our code. So let's hit run. And as we see, we have uh, run this uh, cell successfully, as shown uh, by this uh, green tick. And then in this cell, we load the data uh, set. As I previously mentioned, that after downloading the data set from this website and we convert into uh, into dot mat file files, we um, have these two files in our workspace, which these are the two uh, .mat files that we're going to use. Okay, so to, do, to load those two um, .mat files into the code, uh, we uh, run the cell. And as we see, we run it uh, successfully. And then we have the function training, uh, testing, uh, data set generator that we described uh, earlier that is responsible for uh, providing us with the testing, training, validation data sets. And here, in here, we implement our model as a class, as I mentioned also in the theoretical uh, part. And again, I um, repeat uh, the important information about the model that we need the kernel size for each convolution layer to be a three of size three by three, and each kernel size uh, and the uh, max pooling layers to be of size two by two. And this is the model architecture uh, we would like to implement. And also, as I uh, mentioned in the theoretical part that uh, when we define the class representing our model, it should uh, have two uh, functions, the our methods, which is the um, constructor, the initializer, and the forward function. And in the initializer, I defined all the required uh, layers layers uh, we need, the, the three convolution layers and the max pooling layer and uh, uh, two linear and uh, uh, two um, fully connected, uh, fully connected uh, uh, layers. And in the forward function, I just connect after creating, after creating those uh, layers with a specific uh, uh, configurations. So for example, as we said earlier, padding same, here means that uh, please, let uh, we ask the convolution layer to preserve the uh, spatial dimensions for the input. And uh, after creating uh, those layers, uh, we here we connect them or we uh, put them into action in the forward function. So X here represents the patch in our case, which will be in this part five by five by 16. And we pass it through each uh, layer, and then we return um, the output of the final layer of our model, which is the which should be the class, which should, which no not not the class, it should be the uh, logit, which is simply the probability uh, mass uh, function across the fifteen classes we have. So this is the uh, um, value retained by uh, our model. So each time you patch, you, you pass a patch to your model, yeah, you will get output of 15, which is simply the probability that your patch is belonging to uh, uh, one of these classes, the, uh, the 15 classes. Which is the, yeah. So this is the uh, uh, model implementation as a class. So let's hit run here and also uh, run successfully. And in here, uh, this part is just to um, 
uh, prepare the data sets uh, in a way that is uh, compatible with PyTorch. So we here, for example, we um, convert from NumPy, uh, from uh, NumPy uh, type to uh, Torch type, uh, which we call it Tensor, which called Tensor in, in the matrix types in, in, in PyTorch called Tensor. So we, we here convert from uh, NumPy in the array type to Torch uh, type and we and we uh, prepare the data set as as i said earlier uh, as the patches and the corresponding uh, labels uh, we um, we provide them as as a tuple we concatenate we or we combine them as a tuple and so our function so finally so our data set this is um, data set is simply just a array of tuples where each tuple contains uh, the patch and the corresponding uh, corresponding uh, label uh, with it. So let's hit run here. Oops, I forget to. Okay. All right. I forget to run this. Let's run this again. Perfect. And this function will be used to uh, update uh, update the uh, model parameters during the training. So let's hit run. And let's start the training uh, process. Uh, in here, uh, we have uh, 200 epoch. So we will, um, we will uh, retrain the model for three times. And uh, in each time, uh, we will have uh, 200 uh, epochs. And also, uh, what else? Yeah, also, we did the batch size. We divided, um, uh, we divided our training data sets and also the validation data sets into a batch size, uh, a batch size of 128. So, uh, so each batch size, uh, Will be of size 128. Let's define the function and this is start the training process. And as we can see here, we see the train loss and the validation loss across each uh, epoch we have. And as we see, um, the losses are decreasing uh, through uh, epochs. As we see, we start with two something, and in here we have uh, very small values, as we can see. Again, we redo the training again. As I said, we train for three times. All right, so what we have here. Okay, so in here, the training uh, phase finished, and we can see the um, loss as a function of epoch for the training loss and validation loss. So the training loss is uh, over the using the training data set and the validation loss, loss is calculated using the validation data set and we can see the two curves are very smooth and they uh, they are reducing um, as the uh, epochs um, evolve as as we can see they uh, almost approach zero so right now we have a trend model. So it's time to evaluate its performance. As we said earlier, using the three metrics, inference map, confusion matrix, and the total accuracy. So let's hit run for the, for defining the inference uh, function. And for the confusion matrix as well. And let's call the inference, uh, Let's call the inference uh, function and the confusion uh, matrix uh, to see the performance of the trend model.
Okay, so the function inference and the function um, confusion math, uh, both of them have um, uh, finished execution. And as you can see, right now we are uh, seeing the uh, inference uh, map. And as we can see, generally speaking, um, the, mod the model has done a pretty good uh, job. For example, if we look at um, th these pixels, which represent a playground, we can see uh, it has uh, been correctly uh, classified. So the, this green represents the grass synthetic, grass synthetic, and those orange represents the running, which uh, makes sense. And uh, what else we can see here? Um, as we can see, so uh, the model, um, generally speaking, is um, able to learn uh, to classify uh, pixels uh, correctly, generally speaking. And also, by looking at the confusion matrix, we see that uh, our training, um, our trained uh, model has a really very, very good performance. As we see, we have uh, the max almost one across the main diagonal, which means that we have a very high sensitivity for each class, which is, um, so sensitivity is a very important uh, metric to um, assess the model performance. And also we have a, a total uh, accuracy which is very high, also um, 98%. Uh, 98%, uh, but uh, we also, we should uh, take into consideration that uh, sometimes this uh, metric is not very representative because um, if you don't have, or if we don't have a balanced, balanced, um, classes or yeah uh, balanced uh, samples across all classes then this number will not be, be uh, very representative and in our case we don't have a balanced um, samples per uh, classes but uh, by looking here we can see that the model is performing really really uh, uh, very well so this is regarding uh, generating the inference map and here for the uh, confusion matrix and the total uh, accuracy So let's get back to the theoretical part to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, part two after uh, we have finished the uh, first part of this exercise. In part two, uh, we will use uh, what we call multi-experiments interface. This interface enables us to do multiple experiments, retrain the model, I mean by experiment, by simultaneously sweeping the following variables. Patch size, and we call it in the code patch size sweep. Second parameter is the number of training samples per class, and we call it sample size per class sweep. And uh, the number of convolutional layer, and we call it depth sweep. And here depth is specifically means the number of convolutional layers only, not the total number of layers uh, in the model. So we aim to use this interface to investigate the following three scenarios. In the first scenario, we aim to explore the effect of changing the number of training patches. We will do this by sweeping the number of training samples per class across three values, 20, 100, 1000. So uh, we did three sweeps um, variables in the interface to be defined uh, as follows. But first, let's take a look at the interface to really uh, understand what's going on here. So this is our interface. As we can see, the user is responsible to define the values of the three uh, sweep or sweeps, three uh, sweep variables, which is, as we mentioned previously, patch size sweep, sample size per class sweep, and depth uh, sweep. And for each scenario, we should change uh, the values of those three uh, parameters and uh, run the code to see uh, what's going. So getting back to scenario one, we said that in scenario one, we will see what is the effect of the training uh, data set size. This is simply what a scenario one is trying to um, describe uh, or uh, try to investigate. Sorry. For the scenario two, and uh, for the scenario number two, we aim to explore the effect of changing the number of convolutional layers in the model. We will do this by sweeping the number of convolutional layers across three values from using one convolutional layer only to using three convolutional layers to five layers. 
So we let the three sweep variables also to have these values as we would see. And in the final scenario, we aim to explore the effect of changing the patch size. I mean, dimensional size. We will do this by sweeping the patch size across three values from one, five, and uh, 20. And uh, we would like to see what will be the effect of uh, these different patch sizes on the learning process. So let's start with the first scenario and let's make sure that we are using the right values for the th three swift parameters. So this seven, okay, I think we already have uh, these values in the interface. All right, seven, right, we have this. So let's just uh, make sure that we, um, all right, so. Come here and run time, run after. So those functions are the exact same uh, functions in terms of main functionality as the previous functions defined above. However, they are just tweaked for this interface to be able to um, run multiple uh, experiments simultaneously. That's it. So for example, if we uh, look at the strain grid, it's the same main, fu the fundamental functionality is exactly uh, similar to a uh, train function we have, but it has some uh, differences to be able to uh, generate multiple, to run multiple times um, and to, um, be suitable for uh, experimenting with different uh, sub parameters. That's it. As we said earlier, we are just sweeping this guy to see the effect, the effect of uh, changing the number of um, samples training samples per class and in here we are using we are using 20 samples per class and we can see that the train loss is uh, relatively high compared to using um, 100 samples per class so you can see you can look at the train loss if you compare the train loss in here the minimum value maybe is something between 0 and 0.5 in here it's almost 0 also, we see that uh, the validation and also the training dose are very noisy. And however, in here we have the very smooth, uh, relative, very, uh, relatively uh, very smooth curve compared using a uh, very small number of sample uh, of training um, samples. And we are waiting right now for using 1,000 sample samples per class for training will be much better for sure. And also we can look at the accuracy. You can see the accuracy is much worse when using training, uh, less number of training uh, samples. And this makes sense because uh, you're only exposing your model to a very, very small number of samples. So it will not uh, have uh, the capacity to learn uh, different representations and uh, uh, features about uh, different classes. But in here, see the accuracy has increased in a dramatic way from 82 to 95%. Uh, we are talking about more than 10% uh, increment in the accuracy, which is very uh, significant uh, increase. And in here, so we can see that when using um, 1,000 sample per size, uh, when we are using 1,000 sample, uh, training sample per class, we can see we have the best result in terms of the uh, uh, validation loss and the training uh, training data loss, sorry, train, train, training loss. And we can see we have the best accuracy and so um, actually these these three results are very uh, logical and this is what 
we have expected before running the code that using very small number of sample size will cause uh, a poor performance, generally poor performance. And uh, as we can see, the, the, the curves are very noisy. And in here, when we increased from 20 samples to 100, we have much, much better performance and much better uh, accuracy, much better accuracy and much more smooth curves. And when we use 1000, we have the best um, accuracy as well. And also in terms of the smoothness and also in terms of the validation uh, and training uh, losses. So this is regarding uh, scenario uh, number one, which is to see the effect of, um, to see uh, the effect of the uh, training samples per class. So now getting back to scenario two, Yeah, we copy the values for the three variables. And we get back to the interface. And I've already paste them and I've run uh, the cell. And as we can see here, with a very, very shallow um, model in terms of the number of convolution layers. So in here we have only one convolution layer. We have the model uh, is performing not that but it has a good performance in general as total accuracy is 94%. However, compared to the, let's say, the optimal number of convolution layers, which which is a three, we have 95, which have a slightly, or a, we can say we have almost 1% increment in the performance, um, in the total uh, accuracy uh, for, the, for the model. However, when we have used five convolution layers, we started to see the issue of overfitting and we see the model with the five convolution layers um, has the worst performance and this is understandable because this model maybe seems that it is uh, much more complicated or um, uh, yeah much more complicated complicated compared to the uh, data set we are uh, using to train it so that's why we started to see a uh, much worse performance compared to the shallower two uh, models. So this is the effect of changing the number of convolutional layers, which is simply just we are uh, seeing the effect of changing the complexity of the model itself. So it is not restricted to the convolutional layers. We can change the total number uh, of layers in the model. But in here, just for the sake of simpl simplicity, we just focusing on the number of convolutional uh, uh, layers. And as we can see, um, having less um, number of, of, of parameters maybe will cause the problem of underfitting and having uh, much more uh, number of parameters for your model will cause the problem of uh, over um, Fitting, which means that the model is has been uh, focusing um, or, or mistakenly um, modeling the noise in the model, uh, and that's why when we uh, test it uh, on um, testing data set, it will perform a much worse compared to a shallower version uh, of the model. So this is for the scenario uh, number two. Now let's see what will be the effect of changing the dimensional uh, size of the patches. And this um, question should be addressed by scenario number three. And here is scenario number three. Let's copy the variables. And so we will... Uh, change the patch size from uh, 1 to 5 to 20 and see what will be the effect on the learning uh, process. So let's uh, let the code run. So uh, after we let the code to run, uh, we see that um, when patch size uh, is one, 
we have the uh, worst performance compared to the uh, other um, values of the patch size. And this can be justified uh, by the fact that when the patch size is one, actually we are not using any special features for, <clears throat> for the classes. So the first output of the convolution, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the output of the first convolution layer will be nothing but uh, a scaled version of the kernels um, or uh, plus padding. So what I'm trying to say is that um, when the patch size is one, actually we are not uh, utilizing any spatial information from the pixels surrounding the uh, center pixels we are trying to uh, classify or we are trying to uh, train uh, the model on. That's why we have the worst uh, performance, uh, we can say, compared to the other two patch size. And here, when we have the patch size of, uh, of five, we have uh, the best uh, performance. And when the uh, uh, patch size um, 50, right now we start to have the problem of uh, overlapping between different classes. What I mean is that one, um, one patch will start to have pixels from different classes. So this will uh, uh, start to uh, reducing the, and here it is not very, significant the reduction in the performance however if we let the patch size to go for example to 1000 for example or something like this then we will have this issue that one patch the one patch will contain several uh, classes instead of uh, pixels uh, belong to a specific class and this will uh, for sure um, reduce uh, the overall performance of the model so uh, to conclude when the patch size is very small actually we are not utilizing the um, spatial features and spatial characteristics uh, for each class and this will uh, heavily impact the model uh, performance as we see here and when we have the reasonable size of the patch we are uh, utilizing the spatial features as well as the spectral features and we have um, the best performance compared to the two others. And when we let the patch size to go uh, beyond reasonable limits, we will start to uh, have a worse performance because right now each patch each patch will have uh, will have uh, several classes instead of uh, only uh, one class. So uh, this is regarding this exercise. Um, to conclude, in part one, we just um, train a two D um, convolutional neural network with a specific architecture, and then we evaluate its performance using three different um, evaluation metrics. Then in part two, we try to sweep and we play with different hyperparameters, which are batch size, um, number uh, of samples per class, uh, training samples per class, and the uh, number of convolutional layer in the model, and we see uh, the effects of um, different values of these uh, uh, parameters. And now let's go to the applying uh, 3D convolutional uh, neural uh, network on um, hyperspectral uh, images. So now speaking about uh, applying uh, 3D CNNs for hyperspectral image classification, it's exactly almost identical to what we have described for uh, or in 2D CNN. The only difference is that the way we look at this cube. In 2D scenario, uh, we were considering this cube as a function from points in a 2D space to um, a space of um, originally 144 dimensions or after PCA reduction to a uh, uh, dimension of 16. However, in 3D, um, in 3D world, we are considering this cube as, the, we consider the three dimensions of the cube as belonging to the spatial, um, as a spatial uh, dimension. So um, it is like we are mapping um, the height, width, and the depth to some values and since we only have th three dimensions for the cube, so we actually mapping it to a dimension of one, of value, of value one. So you can consider this cube dimension, the actual dimension, or as a function. You can look at this cube as a function of 
100, um, or you can consider this cube as a function representing uh, a mapping from uh, 300, uh, 349 multiplied by uh, 1905 multiplied by 144 to this is spatial space. This is our domain that we map these spatial points to a scalar value, which will be a dimension of one. So you can consider this um, cube also multiplied by one, which will be the same size. So this is right now the way we look to the cube in order to apply the 3D convolutional um, neural network. And the only difference will be for sure in the model um, implementation or model, uh, model architecture. So right now everything will be 3D because right now our spatial dimensions are, we have three spatial dimensions instead of two spatial dimension, dimensions as in the 2D case. So right now our uh, kernel size uh, for the convolutional uh, right now we have 3D convolutional layers instead of 2D convolutional layers. And uh, the size, uh, we require the size to be 3 by 3 by 3. And also we are applying uh, padding as we exactly did for the uh, 2D case. And the kernel size for the 3D max pooling layer should be 2 by 2 by 2. And this is the almost the exact same uh, architecture. But instead of having three convolutional layers, here we have uh, only two convolutional uh, layers, as we can uh, see. So this is the only uh, difference. And in here, we are not applying any PCA reduction for the cube. So we are using the original. Uh, we are using the original cube. And just we let the code to run and see the evaluation metrics. So there's only one part in this exercise. So import the libraries. Uh, load the data set required, prepare this function, which is training testing data set generator, um, define the model as a class, subclass, and this function that is responsible for training and uh, for training, uh, sorry, for updating the weights, and maybe because I didn't talk uh, about it uh, in the previous exercise. In this exercise, we can see this here, the heavy lifting um, is, is happening here regarding updating the model uh, parameters. So simply speaking, uh, inside this uh, for loop, we see that we are, um, we are looping through each batch in our training data set. And in here, so BX1 representing the raw data or the patch, the patch, the, the batch batch, the patch batch, and by represents the label batch, label batch. So b and those are having multiple samples in, in them. And we, uh, as we said earlier, the batch size is 128 uh, samples. And then we pass uh, them through the model. So we are doing this is forward. This is forward uh, propagation. And then we calculate the loss function, which is multi-class uh, cross entropy, and then um, and then uh, in here we just um, erase any uh, uh, calculated gradients from the previous uh, iterations, and uh, in here we cal we do the um, in here we actually calculating the gradients by by, by calling this function backward. We are um, doing the back propagation and we calculating the uh, we calculating the gradients across all the model uh, parameters, and then we just update the model parameters using this optimizer optimizer step that we already defined here. The um, here the optimizer and the training. Here we have, it is, uh, we used uh, Adam optimizer with the learning rate, this learning rate, and the uh, and the loss function, as I said earlier, is the cross entropy uh, loss function, and all of the all of these can be found in PyTorch uh, library. So this is simply what uh, how we train our model straightforward, and let's hit run. Okay. Fourteen and this it's done here. And actually, let's start uh, the training, but um, it will take uh, some time.
So after we let the code uh, to finish, um, we see that we have finished uh, training um, the model. And right now, let's do the inference map to generate it. It's confusion matrix. And actually, uh, I have previously uh, run the code and um, we already generated the inference map. And as we can see, uh, the model is um, performing uh, really well. And also, again, if we look at this playground, it has been almost uh, correctly uh, classified. And uh, regarding the confusion matrix, we see also we have um, almost one across the main diagonal, and the total accuracy is um, almost 91%. Uh, percent. Uh, so that's it for the 3D uh, convolutional neural network. It is exactly the same as the 2D convolution neural network instead that we are using a 3D convolution neural uh, network instead of 3D, a convolution layer, sorry, instead of uh, 2D. And um, we have uh, train, train it and test it exactly like we did for the 2D. And that's it for this exercise. Thank you very much and hope you have uh, enjoyed and um, benefited from uh, these two uh, exercises. Hello everyone. Today I want to give a tutorial for the IE summer school. The title of the tutorial is the effect of data variability on generalization for hyperspectral image classification. The part one is the introduction. In this experiment, we will set up a simple 3D CNN for hyperspectral image classification based on transfer learning. The goal of this experiment is to demonstrate how sensitive CNN type architectures can be to differences between training and the variability testing conditions. Depending on the extent of this difference, we can leverage a simple fine tuning process to update network weights to adapt to the new data conditions. Or we may need to use advanced transfer learning algorithms. In this experiment, we will use a simple fine tuning as a demonstration. The data set we will use for this experiment is from the 2013 i.e. GRSS Data Fusion Challenge. It's compri comprised of a ground choose of size 349 times 1905 times 144. Each pixel in this image resides a 144 vector space, representing the spectral reflectance values spent Spanning 144 bands in the viewable and the near infrared regions of the spectrum. We define the points in the image that are not shadowed as a source domain and those that are covered by the shader as the target domain. As shown in figure one below, the shader area is on the right. The figure one, two college of the University of Houston. 2013 data set with the ground truth of six classes in the different colors. The detail of this data set could be found in this paper published by Professor Prasad. As see in the table one, there are six classes in the data set. The number of the low shader sample points is 11, 15 in the source domain, and shader sample points is 1441 in the target domain. The detail of the class labels and number in the source and target domain could be found in table one. Now I want to prepare the data set and for training and testing data. First, I want to introduce the image cube generation. The image data and class labels, source domain and target domain 
are available in three separate MATLAB files with MAT extension. Q, cube MAT, is the original hyperspectral image. Source label MAT contains the corresponding labels for each pixel in the source domain. Target label MAT contains the corresponding labels for each pixel in the target domain. Therefore, the data are loaded into Python using the load might function available in the IO module of SPICY. This is implemented by the function of load data. The input of the network is based on a small patch cube and the corresponding label of the patch center pixel. Thus, we need to split the original image into small patches. In this demo, the patch size is set as 16. A 13. The shape of the each patch is 13 times 13 times 144. This is implemented in the function of create image cubes, especially to avoid the informa information loss of the margin. We use the operation of padding named as pad with zeros. After generating the patch cubes dataset, we split the dataset into two parts, training and testing sets. One important thing to note is that randomly generating split of the data set is not always the optimal solution, as the proportion of different categories can be extremely different. To address this issue, we adopt the method of stratified sampling. This technique contains con con consists of forcing the distribution of the target variables among the different splits to the same. The small change will result in training on the same population in which it's being evaluated, achieving better predictions. This is implemented by the function of split train test set. After that, based on the function of create data loader, we combine a data set and a batch size and provide an iterable over the given dataset for the training and the testing process of the PyTorch. After that, I want to introduce the part three, network architecture. The network architecture is based on a 3D CNN. An overview of the 3D CNN architecture is presented as below. It includes eight layers, the network architecture is presented by the function of 3D CNN. The detail of each layer could be found in this picture. After that, I want to introduce the model training and the testing process. For the model training, after implementing the model of 3D CNN, we need to train it using the train dataset we previously prepared. This is implemented by the function of train. It can be summarized as follows. It will divide the training dataset into smaller subsets we call batches. Then each batch will be fed into the model to compute class predictions for each batch samples. Then these predictions will be used to calculate the loss function. We call this flow as the forward propagation, which starts at the model input and ends at loss function output. We use the loss function output computed at the final stage of the forward propagation and feed it back to the model to compute the gradients and update the model weights. This reversed flow starts with the loss function output and ends at model input, backward propagation. So, during the training phase, each batch should go through the forward and backward propagation. Looping through the all batches for one time is the definition of a, an epoch. For each epoch, we can define the training loss as the mean of the batch loss across all batches. For the testing process, we divide the testing dataset into batches as of we did for the training dataset. However, each testing batch 
it only to go through the forward propagation to calculate its loss. The tating loss can be defined similarly as the training loss by taking the mean of the tating batches losses. Based on the training and the tating process, we should use uh, evaluation metric. The first metric is the COPA coefficient. COPA coefficient is the ratio that takes into account the effect of uncertainty on the classification results and it's used for consistency testing. The overall occurrence indicates the proportion of the total correct classification results in all samples. The average occurrence represents the average of the proportion in which each category is correctly classified, taking into account the classification of each category. The corresponding calculation equations are shown as follows. After that, I also would present the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is the square matrix, which one dimension represents the true classes, and the other represents the predicted classes. So let the first dimension, I, represents the true classes, and the second dimension, J, represents the predicted classes. Then Cij can be divided as the conditional probability, CIG, where Y is the predicted result based on the 3D CNN model. Based on this definition, we can see that the sensitivity of each category resides on the main diagonal of the confusion matrix. Function, confusion mat takes over train model, and the testing data set defined previously as its argument to generate the confusion matrix. Furthermore, we also provide the classification map generation. The map contains the class, the class prediction for each pixel. It serves as the visual evaluation of the model performance, which is of great importance when the number of ground truths is less than the number of all overall pixel. As is in our case, function get class map by generating the classification map based on the 13 results. The final part is the part six. We will introduce the experiment. In this demo, we first train the model in the source domain, then conduct two experiments in the target domain. Experiment, exper experiment one is conducted using the source dataset. The dataset is split into two parts, training and testing set, with a ratio of 13% to 90%, corresponding 334 patch samples in the training set and 781 patch samples in the testing set. The batch size is set as 64. The training apex are 500. We would save the training weight named as hyperparameter PTH to be used in the next two experiments. Experiment two is conducted using the target dome dataset. The dataset is split into two parts, training and testing sets, with the ratio of 10% to 90%, 19%, corresponding 144 patch samples in the training set and 1297 patch samples in the testing set. With the pre-trained weight from experiment one, we directly test the model in the target domain testing dataset. Experiment three is also conducted using the target dataset. The batch size is set as 64. The training epochs are 300 but it's a little different from experiment two. We first fine tune on the model based on the pre-trained weight from experiment one. After fine tuning, we test the model in the target data set. So I want to scan the detail of the code. Firstly, based on this module, we would download the uh, uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Cubemite 
soft label mite and the tart label mite. After why? After that, we will import some uh, package from the Python and Pytorch for our further use. The loaded data we use were loaded labels and the data for the data set. And the module of pad with zeros would give us the, the data set with, after padding. After that, we would create the image cubes for the data set. The image cube size is a 13 times 13. So after that, we would split the data set into 20 and 13 sets. Based on it, we would generate the iterable of the training data set. Similarly, we would also generate the iterable for the testing data set. Based on the iterable function and class, we would generate the create a data set loader. The data set loader would output the train loader, test loader, or data loader and its corresponding neighbors. After that, I would design the CNN 3D class. The CNN 3D class is pretty simple as shown in this module. Based on this module, I would use the touch summary to print the detail of the architecture of the 3D CNN. Okay, <laughs> is that clear? Based on the architecture of 3D CNN, then we could train the model. The definition of the tra training process could be found in this module. And we would loop through <clears throat> many epochs. Based on the epochs, we would print the epoch, the loss function, the loss average, and the current loss of each epoch. Based on the training process, we would output or save the late work, the epoch loss, and based on the saved late hyperparameter PTH, we could test the model based on the test data set. So based on the test data set, we would output the predict test results and the ground truth of the testing data set. After that, we would evaluate or our model, such as the occurrence, all of these would be presented in the occurrence re reports. The reports would output the classification map, the and the class and the classification map would visualize the prediction results. In addition, we would also provide the loss fig. So let's. Into, uh, let's present the experiment one in the source domain of the training and testing. The training process would uh, have 500 epochs. After training, we could see that the Kappa occurrence would be 87%, the overall occurrence would 89%, and the area occurrence is 80, also nearly 89%. Based on the accuracy, we would provide the confusion matrix and we would provide the training nodes versus the training epochs during the training process. So this is the classification map. The first image is the ground truth of the classification map. And the second image is the predicted results. We, we could see that the accuracy and the visualization of the predicted results is pretty good. Based on it, and also test on the target domain directly with the pre-trained weight from the source domain. Surprisingly, we could find that the area currency is only nearly 17 percentage. This means that the accuracy will decrease about 20%. And this is the results of the re visualization for the mm, target domain. So based, uh, based on it, 
to enhance the performance on the target domain and conduct the experiment three. This experiment would find two on the target domain based on the pre-trained weight from the source domain. After fine tune the model, we could find that the accuracy of the uh, teaching data set would increase a lot. After that, we could see that the, occurrence, the overall accuracy would be close to the original source domain. And this is the uh, classification maps. And we, by comparison, we could find that the accuracy would increase a lot after the process of the fine tuning. Finally, I would uh, show the acknowledgement. Our implementation is mainly based on the following code base and paper. We gradually thank the authors for their wonderful works. Thanks so much for your listening. That's all.